Well, why wait any longer? It's an exciting meeting ahead. We might as well call it to order and get started. So I need to approve the agenda. You'll notice there are two sets of minutes. There are three delegations. There's a briefing, and there are two items of business. There's also some items of correspondence. Are there any proposed changes to the agenda? Seeing none, I guess I should have a, I need a mover and a seconder in any event. Moved by Councillor Holland, second by Councillor Osterhoff. Any discussion? We will vote on the agenda. All those in favor? And that passes, thank you. Now the minutes, there's two sets. So the one from our last meeting, which was April 9th. We have one motion for both. Is okay? So I we'll, need a motion to um, approve the two sets of minutes. So from April 9th, our regular meeting and from the special meeting on June 25th. Need a mover and a seconder. Move by Councillor Osanek, second by Councillor Osterhoff. Any errors or omissions in those minutes? Seeing none, we will approve them, we will vote on them. All those in favor? And that passes, thank you. Disclosure of pecuniary interest. Seeing none, we'll move right to delegations. There are three delegations. First up is Jason Jobin, the Water Projects Coordinator for Red Squirrel Conservation Services, and he's speaking to us regarding the Depave Paradise Initiative. Just a reminder to all of our delegations, you have five minutes plus whatever questions we ask. Very simple. Oh, very good. All right. I will give you a 30 second warning when you get to the four and a half minutes. Okay. okay. All right. Well, I first wanted to thank uh, the council and the committee for allowing me a few minutes to speak here about Depave Paradise Initiative. Um, I just really wanted to make everybody, at least in the room, aware. Um, and then show a few pictures of what that can look like, and then possibly maybe some of the ways that the city as a whole can be supportive of this initiative. Uh, some of you might already be aware of what DPA Paradise is because we've been uh, in the news cycle in the past couple weeks for our work at St. Lawrence College. There might be somebody you recognize in that photo. Um, it's a pretty great photo because it demonstrates pretty well what the main event is, the actual DPA event. Uh, and what you do is you find a piece of uh, asphalt, which is, which is either underused or ugly, uh, needs repairing, and you cut it up into manageable pieces, and then volunteers come in, they uh, pry it up, and then it ends up being taken away and recycled, and then that space ends up being replaced with something more permeable, so uh, it can be grass or a pollinator garden or even just gravel. Um, and that's the main goal, is to uh, increase permeability of a site. So in most uh, urban areas, more than half of the water that lands on uh, a surface is going to end up just going straight into the uh, sewer system. And if you are in downtown Kingston, that sewer system is also the sewage system, uh, which is what often causes the uh, backups and overflows. Last year, I believe we had 26 overflows, and 25 of those were due to uh, too much water going to the system, either from too much rain or too much snow melt going in at once. Um, and then also, whenever water rushes in, it takes in uh, sediments and pollutants and everything like that. So the goal is to increase permeability in an area, allow the water to slow down, uh, be soaked up into the ground, and be filtered out. Uh, Kingston is definitely no stranger to these sorts of events, and due to change in climate, uh, we expect these events to be more common. So this is one small way that people can help mitigate the changes that are going to be coming. Often, Deep Pave Paradise events are done at schools, and that's because they have these nice big areas you can work with, and then obviously working with children is always great. Uh, but you can do them in more urban areas as well. This is one that's being done in Peterborough just a couple weeks ago, uh, people having fun planting there. Uh, this is one in North Bay where uh, they, there's this very common area in cities where you have a sidewalk, a parking lot, and then just useless asphalt uh, in between. Uh, so this asphalt was replaced with, uh, you know, flowers for pollinators and other insects, trees for shade and habitat for uh, birds. Um, another one in Hamilton here. Uh, taking a site which is largely useless and putting into something that people actually want to be around. Uh, another nice one in Hamilton. Um, and this is what I would call a very engineered approach where a, uh, a parking lot was completely dug up and then replaced with something called Eco Raster, uh, which is hard enough to have transport trucks and everything drive on and survive our winters, but is actual per actually permeable. So this is one of the more expensive and, and engineered approaches you can take. Um, and this is uh, another engineered approach in Quebec where it was uh, 
Uh, some asphalt was replaced with gardens. Now, it doesn't have to be um, this engineered. It could be something as simple as relieving the stress on uh, urban trees like they did in Toronto. Um, and first and foremost, they're super fun events. This is a picture of the first EPAVE in Canada being done right here in Kingston at Mulberry Waldorf School. And it's a great event to have people come out, uh, create a sense of space and community, um, and also raising awareness for what I'm telling you right now. Um, they're just really fun events. How do we make this happen? Well, there's all sorts of stuff that goes into it, um, which Red Squirrel is, um, it has done before, uh, but from a city perspective, it could be as simple as just being aware of what it is, so whenever a permit comes across your desk, you know what a DPAVE event is, pointing out potential projects, or even in the future, perhaps even being a full-time partner like some other communities. Uh, speaking of ones being pointed out, this is one that was pointed out to me by Councillor Osanic um, uh, in the Fox Court area, which I haven't been to the site, but just looking at this picture, um, I can tell you this probably looks like a pretty good uh, spot to do a depave. All that's really there is asphalt and all it does is make weeds and collect heat. Um, so you could create a nice basin in there uh, where the water can go in and slowly filter into the ground. You can have something as complicated as a big beautiful garden or something as simple as just there being gravel and then low-lying juniper shrubs or something. So it doesn't have to be complicated. There's a huge range of what you can do. Um, I just also wanted to plug that we are going to be doing a DPAVE in a few weeks at the Mulberry Waldorf School, which is nice to return to the first site in Canada, and obviously anybody here is invited to attend, so please get in touch if you're interested. And I believe I got in with two seconds to spare. Thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent, like you rehearsed it. Uh, so questions are from the committee are allowed, uh, which gives you a little extra time if there's anything we need to clarify, so if anyone uh, want to ask any questions. Councilor Sanek. Thank you through you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Jobin, for presenting that information. And pictures are worth a thousand words, and those pictures were really good. So how much does something like that cost? Like, um, were you involved with the projects in North Bay or, or Hamilton? Um, or for Fox Court that you showed in Ridgewood Estates, do you know how much like an area like that would cost? So DPAVE events, our community are done by a different groups. So the Kingston and area is done by Red Squirrel Conservation Services. So though I was not involved in those, our umbrella organization, Green Communities Canada was. Um, so I can't speak to the budgets in the other areas, um, but each of them is extremely different. You can have a DPAVE that's costing you, you know, $8,000. I know they did one in Peterborough that cost 80,000. So there's a huge range and uh, that depends on what the partners are, what people are able to contribute, because these events are great for having people do donations. Um, an area like this one, I just did some really rough calculations. About It's about 150 meters squared. Um, to turn that into a super basic um, garden with like maybe three plants per meter squared, taking out about six inches of gravel, uh, you'd be looking at about $13,000. About 4,500 of that is taking away those six inches of gravel. So in a situation like that, where the city, for example, would be a partner, if they were able to use those aggregates somewhere else, you're automatically knocking off uh, like $4,000 on that budget. But again, that's just really rough numbers. I haven't been to this site. I'm just going off of the picture and what I can see on Google Maps. Councilor Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I, I, I like what I see very much. And um, I guess I, uh, the question I have is um, off, I just recently saw in, in Mississauga in a parking lot of a hotel, uh, it had a permeable membrane for the parked cars. Mm -hmm. So to me, I sent the picture in because I thought that that was a, a very effective way of also, you know, um, letting rainwater get actually absorbed uh, and less in our st uh, stormwater, but also for you know oils and everything that can, comes off of vehicles in those areas. So um, a lot of uh, benefit from that. So I do. So are you uh, presenting presenting this as an idea for the city to start to utilize? And is what where, where do you hope to see this go? Well. Uh the DPA Paradise Initiative, like I said, has been in Kingston since 2012, uh, okay. though there haven't been that many. Um, and what I'm hoping to do with this presentation is just raise awareness because we, uh, other than the one at St. Lawrence this year, we haven't done one in Kingston in, I believe, three years or so. Um, but there is 
funding from the Trillium Foundation to do 36 across Canada. And the way that the funding works is if um, we have a project that seems viable to Green Communities Canada, then they provide a certain uh, pool of funding for us to work on this. Um, so it is something that some cities do be partnering with people, but often, well, I shouldn't say often, sometimes that can actually create more red tape than it actually uh, cuts through. So usually um, you just have a champion within the city that uh, you know helps respond to questions, direct you to the right person, help with permitting, that sort of thing. Yeah. Thank you, one, one more question. Um, in Glen Burnie at Shannon Park, they did put a parking lot in there. I think someone from the city might know about that. Um, Shannon Park, they, they did do the overflow parking lot for the Ball Diamond in a permeable mm -hmm. green um, surface. Yeah, I think that was, um, that. if that wasn't Eco Raster, I think it was a similar a similar material. And yeah, I, I drove by there a few weeks ago and it just looks like grass, yeah. uh, which is nice. It's um, interesting. And that's, that's I'm not sure about its success, but I'm, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you, I'll go with the Councillor Doherty days and go in order. Councillor Doherty. Thank you. A presentation. Do you have um, a, a bit of an inventory of potential sites that belong to the city that you might be interested in putting forward as for suggestions? Um, but if that's something that this is interested in, in knowing, it's something that I could look into. Um, like I said, often we end up going with, you know, churches and schools because there's a lot less red tape. Um, doing it on a boulevard, you have to get a lot of different people involved in a parking lot. Um, you know, try to convince somebody in, in Kingston to take parking away for even a month to do this. It's going to be a bit of an uphill battle. So uh, doing it with a school where, you know, you just show pictures like this and people are like, all right, let's just make this happen. The Mulberry Waldorf one is going to be turned around in about three months. And um, so that's kind of where our goal was, but we definitely could look into uh, more city potentials. Um, and just putting out to community associations is a really good one as well. I spoke to a few of them. The Williamsville one, for example, is very supportive and at their last meeting, they voted to keep their eyes open essentially and help work with projects. And when it comes to maintenance as well, they're also really great partners because sometimes the perception is that these projects can create a lot more work, um, which isn't necessarily true depending on what you put in. But uh, having a community association adopt it is a great way to alleviate that misconception. C Councillor Holland? I, I have a question. If you, if you could go back to one of the first slides, the one that shows the uh, urban versus with the runoff, the numbers. Oh, uh, this one? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so my question is this. So, so these are two sort of two ex extreme examples. One is the natural, so non-urbanized area, and the other is the urban area, maximum amount, you know, surfaces. Mm -hmm. And you see the, the difference in the runoff, 10% to 55%. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking just of the surface area of the city, and even if every school mm -hmm. went through this in St. Lawrence and, and, and Queens, and, and every educational institution did this, what would be, where would we be as far as getting closer to the, to the natural runoff number? Like, like, how much is this actually changing the runoff number, do you think? If, if we were to do it at, oh, yeah. that seems like a, a master student question. <laughs> uh, I think you'd have to do an actual study on that, but I do get what you're saying, where you are, you, you are in fact not, you know, depaving the entire city, I get what you're saying, but I mean, my response to that is that there's no silver bullet for any of these, and this is just one part of the solution. Obviously, this isn't gonna work in every area, um, and, and in some situations, you can also be diverting more water into a surface. If you were just to create, for example, that parking lot um, in uh, just north of Kingston, um, that only captures the water that lands on it, which is only, you know, let's say 100 square meters, but if you were to have one in an area where water can flow into it, then suddenly you're creating a catch basin, and you know, as long as you do the math right, then you're capturing more water than, than just the surface there. Um, but yeah, I, I can't say exactly how much change it would be even if we did this in every boulevard. That's a whole other, that's, that's a study. <laughs> Well, maybe uh, my other question is maybe more practical because here at the city, and we've got uh, city officials here, 
um, design. And so first, my first question is fairly simple. That green surface Councilor Rostov was talking about at the park or the second parking lot that's permeable mm -hmm. that you just spoke about, what is the cost differential between that and, and paving something? Is, it, is there a big difference? Um, so there are several options. Eco raster like is one. There's just straight permeable pavement, which looks just like pavement. Um, and then there's things like, uh, uh, I think some people call them eco blocks, which are basically you know, like interlockable bricks. That's another option. Um, d depending on who you ask, uh, it's cheaper or slightly more expensive. You could argue r r relatively cost neutral, I guess. Yes, um, but I, I wasn't involved in, in that one that was right. done north of Kingston, so I, I'm not even sure what that is, but I predict that it's an eco raster, which are interlocking plastic, uh, which have basically gravel layers underneath. Yeah. Well, I really like the suggestion you had of the catch basin in conjunction with the green areas and trees for shade, mm -hmm. especially in parking lots. I think we can all agree these, if when we're designing new parking lots, if we actually had areas mm -hmm. and the runoff would go into those permeable areas which would feed the trees and you, mm -hmm. they would grow faster and you wouldn't have to water them. seems to me that there's a win-win-win there. So mm -hmm. I'd be interested in uh, collaborating if, if, there, if you know anything about that kind of design to help, help us get a look at that because we might be able to, uh, to add that to uh, our design of new spaces. Yeah, and if there's a way that, I'm not sure how we would go forward together in, in incorporating that within city design and planning, but uh, we're certainly willing to, to work together. Yeah. Okay, sure. great, thank you. Any other questions? All right, that concludes your delegation. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, on to the next delegation. Michael Capon, resident, will, will be here to speak to us about the City of Kingston Road Safety Plan. And I believe he circulated his presentation to committee members in advance, but we will see. Welcome. Again, five minutes and, uh, and then questions. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Capon. I'm a member of the Kingston Coalition for Active Transportation. I've participated in the development of the Active Transportation Master Plan, and I was appointed to the Road Safety Advisory Group that was part of the Vision Zero process. To implement this Vision Zero plan, we need to do three things. Prioritize speed reduction, design roads for lower speeds, improve traffic flow. Here are some statistics you've likely seen before. The probability of a pedestrian dying as a result of a collision with a motor vehicle rises exponentially with speed. This Vision Zero report prioritizes safety for vulnerable road users, primarily pedestrians and cyclists. To make the road system safer for vulnerable users, we must prioritize speed reduction. Other Canadian municipalities are coming to the same conclusion. Until now, Toronto's Vision Zero program has been a failure. Their rebooted plan now prioritizes speed reduction accompanied by road design changes. Montreal has prioritized speed reduction in their road safety plan with limits of 40 on collector roads and 30 in residential neighborhoods. Hamilton has just decided to reduce their neighborhood speed limits to 40 citywide. If these cities can do it, we can do it. I want to emphasize that it's not enough just to reduce speed limits. We have to reduce actual speeds. Putting up signs is an important first step, but insufficient by itself, as we've seen on Sir John A. Macdonald Boulevard, where the 50K signs have not reduced speeds at all. That's because people respond less to what signs tell them and more to what the road itself tells them. Drivers routinely exceed speed limits because most roads are designed for higher speeds than the posted limit. Sir John A is designed for around 80 and we're telling drivers to go 50. It's like giving a child a cookie and telling them to eat three quarters of it. We're setting them up for failure. To reduce 
actual speeds, we must prioritize speed-reducing road design countermeasures, as suggested by the report preamble, which calls for our roads to be designed to protect users from human error, to be forgiving, to minimize the consequences of collisions that do occur. To do this, we should use a broad array of road design tools to lower speeds, especially install roundabouts wherever possible. The Dutch have perfected low-speed, pedestrian-friendly, and bike-friendly roundabout designs. Raise the roadbed at intersections and crossings. Reduce lane widths and the number of lanes. Create textured road surfaces. Install peripheral features like bollards, trees, planters, furniture, and gateways. These are the top five design elements that reduce speed. Next, it's important for drivers to know that lowering speeds does not have to increase travel times. That's because when speeds are lower, fewer controls that impede flow are needed. For example, drivers can get through an uncontrolled low-speed roundabout faster than having to stop completely at a red light. This was demonstrated last summer when bollards were installed on King Street near Beverly before there was a pedestrian crossing. I myself witnessed not only a high level of courtesy and safety for pedestrians, but also excellent traffic flow. The Dutch have prioritized this ap uh, approach and they've achieved three things. The best road safety record in the world, the highest active transportation mode share in the world, and surprisingly, the highest ranking on the Waze app Driver Satisfaction Index. Dutch drivers are the happiest in the world. We should copy the Dutch. This is what culture change looks like. This is what it means to design our city for people and to foster healthy citizens and vibrant spaces. Our values and priorities are revealed in countless small but key details in our city design deliberate decisions that have prioritized cars for decades. It will take equally deliberate decisions to bring about the culture change of safe roads for everyone as envisioned by Vision Zero. Thank you. Great work, 10 seconds to spare. Uh, <laughs> I can see from your presentation you think we have our work cut out for us. Are there any questions from members of the committee? Councillor Osterhoff. Just to confirm your, um, <clears throat> your comments about the Dutch, of which is my nationality background, we just had a large family reunion. Uh, many, many Dutch are flying home right now, so Canada can breathe a sigh of relief, but they can confirm that you're, uh, we had lots of in-depth conversations about some of those changes, obviously a lot of changes in, in that country, but uh, on traffic issues, which I was very interested in, um, I can confirm uh, exactly what you've said. So um, it's going to take, it takes a while to get that through someone like me. I'm a driver and I like to drive. And, yeah. But if those are the results, then I, I'm listening. <laughs> but I'm still skeptical about it. And, and, but it's good to be here to hear it, to understand it, and to um, chew on it for a while. So that's, that's why I particularly wanted to realize uh, how, um, you know, this is good for drivers as well. Um, we can make the roads better for everybody. Uh, we don't necessarily have to pit one kind of road user against another. We need to deal with the way we design our roads so that everyone can enjoy the roads and enjoy wonderful public spaces. Um, when roads are just a sort of a throughway for people to get from A to B in their motor vehicles, basically kills the public space where we, can, where we can enliven the public space by making places um, that are comfortable for people to be at, for pedestrians and cyclists and other kinds of people. That's the kind of uh, situation where you can, can build community, where people can interact with each other and we get a, a, a feeling of community, public spaces where we, that we can enjoy. Um, the, so I wanted to emphasize the improved flow that you can get when you use um, uh, intersection designs other than traffic lights. And even though it's a lower speed, because you're always moving, you get to where you're going with less frustration. <laughs> I think I saw Councillor Osanek next. Mr. Chair, um, I really, thanks for the presently like this slide that you showed 
um, where it showed the effectiveness, like the ranking, and so it showed roundabouts, most effective, then raised intersections. Oh, Bullards sure. was actually fifth on the list, if um, there's that slide. And I just wondered, right there, or were they in that order, you think, or were they just like the five um, points? Do you think they Roughly, were in that order? Um, yeah, th this I've lived directly from the... Um, they have, uh, since, especially since the 1970s, they have studied uh, road safety relentlessly. They've uh, p made plans, they've implemented them, they've studied the uh, effects of them, and then they've adjusted. And they've continued that process for decades. Um, and they have um, published a lot of what they've found, and it's easily available online in English. Uh, it's very easy to find. Uh, there's a lot of great material. They've make, made it available for everyone to see. Um, and this, this comes from a document called Credible Speed Limits. And it's about um, designing your roads for a, a speed that is going to match or be, at least be close to the speed limit that you've posted. Um, and they studied and they found uh, elements of road design that either caused acceleration or deceleration. So the first is uh, a straight road is faster and a road with curves, people will slow down. Roundabout is the easiest way to do that because people have to steer to go around. Next is vertical deflection where people have to go up or down uh, to get through a space. The most common um, application of that here is speed bumps. But um, really we should be slowing traffic down where it counts the most, and that's at intersections and crossings. So that's why I've uh, emphasized raised intersections and crossings so that um, uh, drivers will slow down at the conflict point. Narrower lanes, wider lanes, people go faster. Narrower lanes, slower. It's, it's sort of intuitive to think of that, but the Dutch approved it. Um, and then textured road surfaces of people uh, drive over a bumpy road, they'll slow down. So cobblestones, like outside here on Market Square, University Avenue, uh, even rumble strips is an example of that. We see that on highways sometimes where uh, when you come on an, an exit ramp, the rumble strips will be there to slow you down. And people respond instinctively and naturally to that. And then the peripheral features are things that are going by in your peripheral vision. Uh, the closer they are and the more there are, uh, the more feeling of speed you get. Um, and as those whiz by, it has a natural slowing effect because you see, you see them going by very close. So we've seen recently a, a lot of bollards, for example, um, installed in Kingston, uh, mainly around road, uh, uh, bike lanes, but those also have the added benefit of uh, reducing speeds. So we can also do more in terms of planting trees, um, street furniture, uh, say on, on the medium, median of Sir John A. Macdonald Boulevard, we could be planting trees or f wildflowers or shrubs or simple things like that. So uh, I believe that these are ranked from the Dutch. I, I'm not sure, though. So uh, um, horizontal deflection really is number one. The Dutch have um, emphasized again and again in all, almost all of their publications install as many roundabouts as you can. That's really number one. Councillor Hall. Thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation. I'm curious about the, all these top five are more, um, would be applicable in certain situations, let's say like for um, design changes or for implementing newer roadways. Uh, what are your thoughts on some of the enforcement measures the potential enforcement around speeding, let's say, the topic that you spoke about a fair bit, um, the, the, more, the more somewhat difficult, um, testy, let's say, yes. areas, yeah. areas of less agreement. Uh, any thoughts on those? Well, as, as the report says, um, we need to take a multifaceted approach to road safety. Um, you know, engineer, the, 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 the big E's, right? The engineering, enforcement, education, evaluation, and I think there's another E in there as well, uh, engagement. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not advocating that we shouldn't deal with those things, and, and the Dutch as well have, 
uh, uh, you know, that's an important part of their road safety program as well. Uh, what I'm suggesting here is that we need to prioritize uh, the most effective uh, countermeasure, the most effective way of reducing speeds, and it's through, through road design. So, um, uh, one of the things they say is that when there's a disconnect, if, you're, if your speed limits are not credible, then most people will exceed the speed limit. So if you go around handing out tickets, speeding tickets to people, you're, you're punishing them for doing what the road is telling them to do. Um, you're punishing them for doing what all the other drivers are doing as well. Uh, you're, you're punishing them for driving at a speed that is appropriate for that road. Um, if we turn that around and make our speed limits credible, then you'll get most people driving at an, at, at an appropriate speed, in other words, closer to the limit. But you're not going to get everybody. There will be some people who deliberately drive dangerously. If, if the speed limit is credible, then the people who are exceeding the speed limit are driving in a way that is not appropriate for the road. They're driving in a way that is deliberately dangerous. And those are the people you can then target with your enforcement. So it's, I can't remember the exact percentages, but the Dutch know all this stuff. Uh, it's something like 85 or 90% of the people will abide by the design speed of the road when you've, when you've designed it for the speed you want. And about 10% or 15% of the people will not adhere to that. They'll exceed the speed limit. Those are the people you need to, uh, to uh, target with your ticketing. Councillor Doherty. Thank you for your presence. Um, so those five strategies on how are the kind of the structural, um, how you change the roads, but for Kingston, and, and some of them, of course, will take longer and they'll take more money. Um, but what what I think I heard is that you would also, that in the shorter term, we could just change this uh, neighborhood speed limits to 40 kilometers, right? That could be one of the first steps and would be not as expensive. And then add to that all of our active transportation implementation plan as well, right? Yes, I think that's, that's a potential something that is is doable in the short term. Uh, that's a question to ask staff about, you know, what the costs would be associated with that. My understanding is that the provincial legislation allows for gateway uh, speed limits, so that um, you don't necessarily have to put the speed limit signs on every block. You can um, d determine a gateway neighborhood, and you s can say within this neighborhood, this is the speed limit, so that when you enter the gateway, the sign tells you that. Um, as I said, signs have limited effectiveness in reducing speeds. Um, so uh, the next step would be perhaps to identify where the speeding uh, issues are, are the most severe and target those places where we need to um, implement design changes to bring the speeds down. Um, we've already, I, I, I used an example already of Sir John A. Macdonald Boulevard. Um, there was a decision made to lower the speed limit from 60 to 50. Um, and when the signs uh, were put in, they, they uh, measured the resulting speeds and there was no change in the, in the speeds. In fact, I understand there was actually an increase in the speeds. Um, they may have come down again. But um, there's, there was more of a disconnect between the road design and the, and the speed limit when the speed limit was lowered. And so it became um, annoying for people to see that when it just didn't feel right to go at that speed. So people actually drove faster as if to say, you know, this, this isn't right. Any, any other questions? Well, I, I'd like to ask a follow-up question then. Um, so I, I, I agree with your main point, which is that it's not so much the signs or the posted speed limit, but the road design itself. Mm -hmm. But of course, that brings with it the whole thing of we have to redesign all of the streets. So I guess, do you have any suggestions 
you, you mentioned bollards already, and I understand they're quite uh, inexpensive, but are there any other easy wins, low-hanging fruit, uh, so to speak, not simply just the gateway 40 to the residential areas we could do, but without that next step, it, as you say, it would be ineffective. Are there, is there anything that you could see in your research that w we might, that seems that could be a go, like, like easy design changes? So you're, you're asking about sort of the cheap and quick and cheap uh, things. <laughs> um, you can do a lot with a bucket of paint. Um, I think in New York City, they've been able to make a lot of changes quickly and easily just by the way they've painted the roads. Um, I, I think, you know, using the peripheral features, um, there, there are some easy things to do, like get involved in more tree planting, uh, bollards, furniture, art, that kind of thing. Uh, things that will, um, uh, the Dutch call it the openness of the situation. If the situation is more complex and more closed in, people will slow down. So that could be an easy win. Um, you might sort of start at the bottom of this list and work your way up, you know, the textured road surfaces. You don't necessarily have to uh, put in cobblestones for the whole street. You could put them periodically along the street so that um, people cross them from time to time, which has a reminding effect to slow down. Uh, I just saw the other day where uh, on, on one road um, the, the, in, in the Netherlands, they had put some cobblestones down the middle of the road so that people were less inclined to pull out and try to pass. Uh, so that was, that was an interesting one. Um, narrower lanes could be done just by painting a shoulder on the road. Um, paint, paint the lanes narrower, you know, I think that, that could be. Or, or close it in, you know, planters along the side of the road just to reduce the, the width of the road uh, could be easily done. Um, the other ones, vertical deflection and horizontal deflection, are going to be uh, more uh, expensive to do. Um, for vertical deflection, you could uh, simply have uh, a raised section just as you approach um, the intersection. I, I love this, um, this Dutch roundabout here because you'll see uh, where the road approaches the roundabout, where the pathway intersects with it, the red pathway, um, the road uh, rises up. You see the little triangles there. Those are indicating that the road rises up. So again, even at an intersection, you don't necessarily have to raise the whole thing. If you just raise the approach to the intersection or the pedestrian crossing, that could be a relatively uh, inexpensive piece of infrastructure. Roundabout, uh, roundabout itself is going to be more expensive, but you'll get an awful lot of safety bang for the buck that you put into a roundabout. Um, that would be a question for the staff about what the expense would be. My understanding, it's a million, something like a million dollars. But you have to start somewhere, and if we can start one, uh, one place at a time, we can start to get that downward trend, which is, which is what the Dutch did. They started just one thing at a time, and they've, over decades, they've been able to achieve it. And that list of five measures that the Dutch have used that you've been studying, those are in the list of uh, possible improvements from the report from the consultant? Yes. Um, uh, many of these, uh, I'm not sure, like, I think these are all in the report. Um, and uh, so what I'm suggesting to council is that uh, it would be great if you can uh, instruct staff to prioritize uh, speed reduction th and through, through road design, uh, items that are, are in here. Yeah. Councillor Neal. Thank you, and I apologize for being late. I'm in the middle of a move, and the movers were an hour late arriving, so I apologize. Um, are you aware that in Ajax and Whitby and quite a few of the suburban GTA, um, they've, in subdivision design, they've replaced four-way stops virtually throughout with the little mini roundabouts, um, which are environmentally positive because you don't have the stop and go, yeah. but, um, and it is a safety feature. Are you aware of that 
that amount that's going on in, in some other communities? Yes, there are a few communities that have, have um, installed more roundabouts. Ajax, Kempville are, are a couple of examples. Um, uh, Waterloo uh, installed a lot of roundabouts. Um, a number of uh, North American roundabouts are, are criticized for not being pedestrian friendly. Um, and I would suggest the problem with some of the roundabouts that have been installed is they have not really focused on reducing speeds. The thing I love about this, uh, this uh, Dutch roundabout is it has all five of those elements in it. So the roundabout itself is your horizontal deflection, and we want to make that radius as small as possible so that the cars have to turn more sharply. That slows them down. Uh, and you can have a shoulder or even a mound in the middle of the roundabout that allows larger safety vehicles to get through them. Um, we see uh, vertical deflection, as I mentioned, where the pedestrian pathway crosses. That's a really important one. We see narrow lanes as we approach the roundabout, which slows people down. We see the textured surface right there, at the, again, at the pedestrian crossing. It's a different color. It's red. I suspect the texture is different as well. And then we see planting around peripheral features or trees, uh, lamp posts, and so on. So uh, in, in developing um, or installing roundabouts in North America, I think it would be good if we could really focus on speed reduction and make sure that what we install is really pedestrian friendly and cycle friendly. I understand uh, that installing roundabouts is currently an option for the staff when they're looking at, at intersections. It seems that most of the time they get rejected. And I'm not sure what the policies are in place that are causing them to be rejected, but that may be a question for staff to say, you know, what are those policies that are preventing the installation of roundabouts and how can they be changed so that, prior, uh, so that uh, roundabouts will float to the surface more often? Um, uh, oh, and also um, there are some uh, cities in Canada that have roundabout guidelines. I know the city of Calgary does. I, I suspect there are some others as well. Uh, it would be really great to see Kingston develop a document of roundabout guidelines so that we can you know, have some of these features in a toolkit so that if and when the time comes to install a roundabout, we can refer to that uh, and, and use that in, in implementation. Uh, thank you. Any other questions? That's great. Thank That's you. excellent presentation. Thank you. thank you. We have one more delegation. So we have Susan Stewart, the Director of the Chronic Disease and Injury Prevention at KFLNA Public Health, will be present to speak to us regarding the Kingston Road Safety Plan. It's good to see you again, Susan. Thank you, Councillor Stroud. Uh, so my name is Susan Stewart, and I'm the Director of the Chronic Disease and Injury Prevention Division at KFLNA Public Health. Um, and for those of you who might be unfamiliar with public health, our mission is to protect and to promote the public's health uh, and strive to reduce health disparities. And we do this through our skilled and dedicated workforce and uh, with our collaborative efforts with our partners. And we also do this through the development and implementation of evidence-based policies, programs, and services to address the public health needs of the residents of KFLNA. So on behalf of KFLNA Public Health, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to support Vision Zero, Kingston's Road Safety Plan, and to talk about our agency's current and ongoing commitment to reduce traffic-related injuries and deaths and to increase active transportation. KFLNA Public Health is pleased to be a member of the Vision Zero Road Safety Advisory Group and to have contributed to this road safety plan which aims to reduce injuries and deaths, particularly among vulnerable road users such as cyclists and pedestrians. We also are appreciative of the opportunity to have participated on the active transportation plan uh, the active transportation master plan technical advisory committee. Sorry, can people hear me when I look down at my notes? Okay. Um, and we are happy to contribute to the plan's aim to, uh, of attaining 20% mode share by active transportation, including walking and cycling. 
And although these are separate plans, the integration of the Active Transportation Master Plan and the Vision Zero Kingston Road Safety Plan is not only logical, but it's actually synergistic. We know that for people to use active transportation, they have to feel safe doing so. And while active transportation is technically for everyone, there are individuals and groups of people who are less likely to use active transportation due to safety concerns. For example, fewer women and families commute by bicycle than men due to fear of traffic. And there are those who are more likely to be injured or killed using active transportation, such as seniors and people of lower income. As such, we were very pleased to see that priority groups in the Active Transportation Master Plan include seniors, youth, and school-aged children, and other vulnerable populations, and that the young demographic and school zone safety are priorities in Kingston's Road Safety Plan. Road safety and active transportation are important public health issues that impact health and well-being, social equity, and the environment. As stated in Vision Zero, Kingston's Road Safety Plan, no loss of life or injury on our roads is acceptable. In partnership with the city and other organizations, we must work collaboratively to prevent collisions and to support road design measures that protect its users from human error. To this end, KFLNA Public Health has contributed countermeasures for emphasis areas, including pedestrians, cyclists, and young demographic, the young demographic, and also aggressive, distractive, and impaired drivers, as was outlined in the report. We are currently conducting a literature review from a public health perspective on road design and traffic rules to reduce injury among pedestrians and cyclists, and we'll be happy to share that once we're completed. We are also working with the City of Kingston and local school boards to advise on safe routes to the school, safe routes to school program and school zone safety for local area schools. So once again, thank you for this opportunity to support Vision Zero, Kingston's Road Safety Plan, and to talk about KFLNA Public Health's ongoing commitment to reducing injuries, deaths, and increasing active transportation. We look forward to further collaboration in the implementation of the City of Kingston's Road Safety and Active Transportation Master Plan. We hope that the EIT committee will recommend that Council endorse Vision Zero, Kingston's Road Safety Plan, and support the proposed countermeasures included in the report. Furthermore, we hope that this committee recommends to Council that the Road Safety Advisory Group continue to meet to review road safety findings and to encourage solution-focused dialogue that will lead to a collaborative approach to road safety in Kingston. Thank you. Thank you. So as before, questions from members of the committee. Councillor Neal. Thank you. I'm aware of um, the fact that Hamilton is now exploring reducing speed limits on both neighborhood streets and in school zones to 30 kilometers an hour in school zones, 40 in residential. And um, what, what are your findings regarding speed and, and risk of injury? Uh, well, the literature review that we're doing is just in this infancy, so I can't comment on that, but I'm pretty sure common sense would dictate the harder you hit something, the worse it's going to be. So I suppose that's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And get a chance, perhaps, looking into the Hamilton model might be of interest. I will ask our staff to do so. Thank you. I have a question. So you said uh, several times that we should endorse the Vision Zero Kingston's Road Safety Plan, but if you look at the report, it's just called the Kingston Road Safety Plan and it makes reference to Vision Zero. In your opinion, is the Vision Zero uh, concept fully realized in this road safety plan as presented? Uh, in my opinion, I think there's a lot of work to be done to reach Vision Zero, where no one is injured or, or killed. Um, and I'm sure we all agree that that's where we want to get. Will this report get us there? Uh, not in a short period of time, not with the uh, limited resource and capacity that every organization, including the city of Kingston, deals with. Um, but is it a step in the right direction? Absolutely. Seeing no other uh, councillors with questions, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we now have a briefing. Surprise, surprise, it's on the road safety plan. 
Uh, it's Ian Semple, Director of Transportation Services, and he will give us a briefing, so it's the official city briefing, and I believe it's, is it 10 minutes, Mr. Semple? 10, ten that, minutes? That's correct. 10 minutes. And I see Deanna Green is here as well. Uh, thank you, Councillor Stroud. Um, and thank you for having us here tonight to, to speak to you about this report and, and the plan that, uh, and approach that we're bringing forward tonight. Um, I'm Ian Semple with the city's transportation services uh, department. Deanna Green, uh, manager of the traffic division is going to speak first about the process, the background and the process and the work that went into the, the uh, report that we have here for you tonight. And then I'll speak uh, a bit about how that aligns with council's priorities and the next steps that we look at as it relates to the transportation work plan overall, uh, the active transportation implementation plan that's, that's forthcoming and, and some other pieces that fit into that work. Thank you, Ian. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, members of the public. I'd just like to walk you through uh, the steps that we went through to put this Vision Zero Road Safety Plan together. As you know, we've been working on this now for over two years, so we're actually quite uh, pleased to bring this here this evening. A lot of work has gone into this, and what Vision Zero means is no loss of life on our roads is acceptable. That includes serious injury as well. And the foundation is to, we want to prevent collisions from occurring in the first place, and then secondly, if a collision does occur, knowing that as humans we make mistakes, so if that collision does occur, we want to reduce the consequences of that collision. The purpose of the road safety plan is initially we want to develop a long-term vision and goal for a progressive reduction to reach zero fatal and zero injury collisions. And we want to focus on pedestrians and cyclists. And we develop road safety measures using the four E's, and we heard about the four E's earlier this evening, and those are engineering, education, education, enforcement, and engagement. And there is a fifth E that will be considered later on, and that's evaluation. But that's when we, uh, later on in the process, after implementation, when we, when we look at the monitoring component. And it's important to use collision data in Kingston to determine why these collisions are occurring, how they're occurring, and what we can do to prevent them. And the road safety plan also provides a framework with respect to how do we best coordinate our resources to focus on the road safety measures. One of the first things that we did um, during the development of this plan was to determine um, the types of collisions that were happening. We looked at a five-year period from 2012 to 2016, and because we didn't begin work until 2017, we didn't have a full set of data um, until that 2016, and so that's why we use that five-year period. So on average over that five-year period, we're seeing 30 cyclists injured per year, and I should mention as well that the fatal injuries need to be combined because fortunately we have such a low number of fatalities that we need a larger number to even look at those uh, categories properly. So 30 cyclists per year. We do have three fatal collisions per year on average, uh, 43 pedestrians injured per year, and uh, in total, there are an average of 359 collisions, injury plus fatal, and that's every year. A tremendous effort was made to engage the public during completion of this plan, and one really important component was we put together what we termed a road safety advisory group, and some of those members are here this evening, and that was made up of uh, 40, 14 community safety partners. The city was one of those. Um, public health, we had KCAT, Cycle Kingston, Kingston Police, the school boards, tri board, uh, so you have the list in front of you as well of the uh, other 13. We had two public open houses. We had six pop-up events when we went out to the public. And we completed an online public opinion road safety survey. And we did hear back from 459 members of the public who shared with us what they felt uh, their road safety concerns were in the city. The draft plan was posted on the city's website in June. And we did receive back uh, a handful of responses with comments. These are just the logos of the 14 road safety partners. Um, 
that made up the Road Safety Advisory Group. So they spent a tremendous amount of time working with us. We did have three uh, five-hour workshops with them. They went through a lot of editing for the report as well. And the vision that we came up with, and I say we, it was in working with the Road Safety uh, Advisory Group, as well as with consultation in the public. Um, the vision is zero fatal and injury collisions involving any type of road user. And these are a very long-term, high-level, very strategic, aspirational uh, visions and targets here. And zero collisions with vulnerable road users, such as pedestrians, cyclists, and motorcyclists. And the five-year goal that the uh, Road Safety Advisory Group in the city came up with was over five years, at least a 10% reduction in fatal and injury collisions involving any type of road user, and as well as a 10% reduction in collisions with vulnerable road users such as pedestrians, cyclists, and motorcyclists. So in order to achieve the goal over five years of that 10% reduction, we would need to see uh, a prevention of 36 injury plus fatal type collisions over a five year period. So if we start with 358, we'd have to be down to about 323 on average. Our road safety plan is built around emphasis areas, we'll get into that a little bit later, and countermeasures. And emphasis areas, they focus on the highest priority collision type. So not necessarily the category that has the most collisions, but it might align with what the public's concerns are, as well as the concerns of the road safety advisory group. And then the countermeasures are actions taken how do we reduce the frequency or the severity of these collisions? So also known, simply put, it's a road safety measure. And these road safety measures or countermeasures, initiatives, they can be led by the city or any of these road safety partners that we worked with in the road safety advisory group. And the countermeasures are again based on the four E. So every single countermeasure was looked at with respect to uh, safety measures related to engineering, enforcement, education, and engagement. The emphasis areas that we developed together with the Road Safety Advisory Group, uh, we chose seven emphasis areas and one awareness area. And so we chose intersections, cyclists, pedestrians, aggressive driving, impaired driving, distracted driving, and the young demographic. The awareness area for school zones was chosen because there was definitely a perception amongst the advisory group as well as the public that school zones were important and we agree with that. So what it means is in thinking about safety measures for any of these emphasis areas, we'll also be very aware if there is a school zone to consider safety measures. And Ian Semple will take the presentation from here. Uh, so the vision set in, uh, in Kingston's road safety plan closely aligns with Council's strategic, strategic priority that you've just set. So in particular, that priority to improve walkability, roads and transportation, and more specifically, the objective to enhance public safety through active transportation and a focus on pedestrian access and enforcement. So the implementation of the road safety measures and the countermeasures and the programs that Deanna was speaking about through an active transportation lens will improve the level of safety for all road users in the city. This approach, which places an emphasis on pedestrians and cyclists, creates a safer overall transportation, including for motorists, through traffic calming, upgraded intersections, education and promotion, and the physical separation of vulnerable users. The city's approach is to align the implementation of the road safety plan to the strategic priorities set by council through a more integrated transportation approach. This approach also recognizes the capacity and the resourcing that exists within the city to undertake this work. So to that end, uh, the forthcoming active transportation plan as part of the, the broader transportation and public works work plan uh, incorporates the emphasis areas related to pedestrians, cyclists, intersections, the young demographics, and the school zone awareness uh, into the work that uh, is encompassed in those, in those plans. The countermeasures for distracted driving, impaired driving, and aggressive driving are led by our, in most cases, by our road safety partners, uh, partners such as Kingston Police, the OPP, uh, and, and public health, as we heard tonight. So the, the 
AT implementation plan identifies cycling and pedestrian infrastru infrastructure, programming and operational investments to foster a culture of active transportation in Kingston. So the plan, um, which will be presented to Council in September, prioritizes improvements to create an integrated citywide AT network and identifies opportunities to develop neighborhood level connections and plans for programming and policy initiatives. So specific to the emphasis areas noted, some examples of the approaches that we that you would see that you will see in the implementation plan that would contribute to enhanced safety include just need the consent of the committee to allow another five minutes for the briefing. Just show of hands. Is that okay? Okay. Go Thank ahead. you. Uh, it include um, completing gaps in our sidewalk networks, so on roadways in particular where a sidewalk does not exist or in connections that need to be made to our schools. Upgrading school and pedestrian crossings um, to ensure that those crossings are safer for the users um, and for all users. Uh, looking at the intersections and how we can prioritize pedestrians and cyclists to use those intersections. In particular, the intersections that we'll be looking at upgrading along the city's, uh, the citywide um, multi-use paths and protected bikeway corridors that are included in the plan. And part of that work involves the education and the promotion and the outreach programs that form part of the active transportation implementation plan approach. In particular, the development of the active route to school program. So this program is again about looking at ways that the city's um, uh, schools and, and um, schools and school children can move in a more active and safer way to their schools. And that en encompasses many of the uh, items that we've been talking about tonight the design of the street, the way in which traffic is calmed, the pedestrian crossings that are in place, and the path and approach that people are taking. So some examples of the work that's already underway include some upgrades for pedestrian safety this year as it relates to some intersection pedestrian signals, uh, most notably at uh, Sir Johnny McDonald and Norman Rogers, and work that's underway at Johnson and McDonnell, uh, Front and Lakeview, and this image in the lower left of King and Beverly that was installed last year. From a cycling safety standpoint, uh, underway uh, right now is the construction of the Leroy Grant multi-use path. So a new connection being created from John Counter Boulevard South uh, all the way through the Kings Court neighborhood to Third Avenue, creating an important cycling and pedestrian connection to the new high school and um, protecting some of our existing cycling lanes with, with buffered and, and bollard protection, this image um, along, along Brock Street and some other work that was done along Johnson Street earlier this year. So beyond the um, work that's, that's outlined in the city's active transportation implementation plan, there's a number of additional initiatives that uh, we're bringing forward as well and that are outlined in the report. So in particular, a review of the city's pedestrian crossing guidelines, um, the ways in which we can use some of the new tools that the province has provided to us um, as a city to, to implement, and the ways in which we can look at traffic calming and the traffic calming policy to find a more appropriate or expedited means in which we can calm some of those areas in our neighborhoods that are of concern. Building on that, there's programs related to automated enforcement, uh, um, aspects of which the red light camera program will be presented to council later this year, and future sort of pending provincial approval, um, programs related to speed enforcement or photo radar systems. All of that in, in, in addition to sort of the road safety, education and engagement pieces that go along with the active transportation program. So the next steps as it relates to uh, the adoption of, of this plan and, and the work is that we would bring forward the AT implementation plan in September of this year. Um, that's, that will be followed by uh, the red light camera report which will come before the end of the year. And in all of that, we're looking at the ways in which we can integrate uh, the road safety plan and the, the approach and the principles that are outlined in the document before you into the broader transportation and public works um, uh, 2020 work plan and our multi-year work plans. Speaking in, in particular to the way in which we design and redesign or reconstruct um, our existing roadways. And then finally, um, in we are 
we propose that you, we bring an annual road safety report beginning in, um, beginning in 2020 that outlines a report on these measures, the work that's been done, and any evaluation that we can share. Thank you. Great. So that's the briefing. Now we go to questions from members of the committee about the briefing and the report. Councillor Neal. Yes, thank you. And long time coming, but I want to thank you for the bollards on Johnson and Brock. Um, I know, and Councillor Stroud shares Johnson Street with me, uh, there was a lot of comments about the speed on those streets. Um, it isn't the only answer, but I have to say, traveling on those streets, uh, traffic has definitely slowed down. Um, how aggressively are we pursuing the opportunity for more ball ballards, ballards? I'm thinking of Princess Street through Williamsville, uh, where we have designated bike lanes, uh, but elsewhere where there are bike lanes. Uh, spe uh, specific to, I think, Brock and, and Johnson Street, you know, the observations that you've heard from, from individuals about, about the speed, we will be doing some studies um, to, to do a before and after of those pieces that we can, that we can share back. We don't have um, uh, plans in place as part of the, uh, the AT implementation plan related to Princess Street through Williamsville. Um, but there, there are a number of corridors that are identified in the AT plan um, that where we'll be building both separated infrastructure, so multi-use paths um, all along King Street and Front Road, um, Henderson Boulevard, um, and then sections of protected bikeway along Bay Ridge and Taylor Kid. Many of the, many, and you can see on, that's in that upper left um, map that you can see on the screen. Um, and, and connecting into Brock and Johnson Street, so connecting um, the infrastructure that we're building along the Rideau Trail uh, north to John Kenner Boulevard and completing some of those connections that we have. So separating and protecting those, those cycling facilities and those, those pedestrian facilities when, um, where it's possible. Before I, I will be pestering you about Princess Street. Uh, so, um, we heard, um, we've all been following, I think, with some interest, Hamilton's uh, moving towards uh, lowering speed limits throughout, uh, throughout residences and in school zones. I know in the past when we've explored that, there was the understanding that we would need speed limit signs on every block throughout the city, which made it fairly prohibitive. Um, have you had an opportunity to look at what Hamilton is, be is doing, and could we look to them for best practices for us to seek uh, lower residential and school zone speed limits? Mm -hmm. Um, I've not reviewed the, the Hamilton um, program um, specifically. I'm aware of, of those changes that they're, that they're um, bringing in, but I've not looked at the details of it. Um, the, the, the changes that they're relying on, I think that you're referring to and that we talked about earlier related to the, the community gateway signage that allows sort of speed limit signs to be installed at the entry and exit of a designated area or neighborhood or community is, um, is is what allows, I guess, less signs to be installed from that aspect of it. Um, from, from the city's standpoint, um, I think, and that was part of the discussion earlier this evening, it's the reduction of the speeds or, or the, the lowering of the speeds is an, is an important component of a, of a broader slate of tools that you may be using within a particular area. So again, back to the, the, the AT implementation plan identifies a number of neighborhood focus areas uh, and the intent of which is to look at ways in which we can more holistically address the transportation concerns that are in those, those neighborhood areas. Speed reduction is, is a, a key component of that, traffic calming, signage, speed limits, but it also in, in the type of, um, I, I think the, 
both the existing street design and the longer term design of what you would reconstruct some of those streets to be. The initial phase of that, um, of that work would involve you know, identifying some particular neighborhoods to work with. And the approach that's outlined is that we would identify um, some schools that we would work to develop a preferred uh, route to school or routes to school and then focus our, our work along those, those areas. So again, within that implementation plan, there's, there's three focus areas that, that are identified um, and there'll be more information sort of about the work that we're proposing with the school boards and the schools in those areas as part of that report. Yes. Speed reduction has environmental uh, benefits as well. Yep. Uh, my final comment um, or question is regarding um, school zones. I, I know that all of us as councillors have received email issues around snow removal and safe maintaining sidewalk safety and and that. And, uh, I think it's a positive step looking at that aspect of it for routes to school. Um, but um, do you foresee us having better uh, public works sidewalk and snow removal? I, I see school buses where kids have to climb over snow bags. Uh, and so it's it's been an ongoing issue. So. In, in the program work that we're looking around school zones or in the active route to school, the preferred route to school, uh, part of that includes the maintenance standards along, that, along the corridor that we would be identifying um, and working with you know, our, um, our colleagues in public works to ensure that that's, that's addressed. It, it goes beyond that though as well. I mean, it's, um, the intention is to also work with, you know, with, with parking enforcement, uh, our crossing guards, um, Kingston Police and, and some of our other road safety partners in order to develop um, all of what's sort of required along those pieces. Um, so there'll be more to come on that, that component. I think specific to the, the, the broader sidewalk, sidewalk maintenance and clearing, um, uh, you know, I think if there are concerns that, that in particular that are arising, we, we certainly would work to identify those and, and address them. Thank you. I just want to uh, ask schools, uh, well, what you've just told us is fresh in our mind. So just remind us, so we have school zones in the city, but they don't have consistent speed limits or they do? Yeah. Mr. Chair, virtually all of our JK to grade eight school zones are posted at 40. Um, the secondary ones are dealt with in a different way, uh, just because typically they are along much busier arterial type roadways, but certainly um, 40 is, is consistent throughout the city for school zones. So 44 primary schools, and, um, and we've heard that Hamilton has, has moved to 30 and uh, 40 in residential areas. Uh, that's for Hamilton. So we're at 50 in our residential areas as a, a citywide uh, speed limit unless otherwise posted and then 40 in this primary school zones. That's, that's where we are right now? Yeah, okay. Yes, so, generally. Yeah. So then my question would just be, is it fair to say that with this report and of course the work that is, is staggering what goes into a report like this, but it, with the report and the recommendation, is it fair to say that sp speed reduction is not, there, are, there is no change in the speed zones as recommended by this report. Uh, it, uh, referencing the, like the citywide speed zones or? So yes, 50, mm -hmm. 50 citywide is posted and 40 in the primary school zones as, and those are posted. Is there anything in this report that would change that, that would reduce those numbers? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, no, there's no specific recommendation to to change this the citywide speed limits. Uh, the approach that that um, is is being recommended more is more specific to neighborhoods or areas in which we can we can couple the speed reductions with with works that would actually can which should contribute to 
to the reduction in speed by the motorists beyond just um, signage changes. So it is a, th the recommendations that would come forward in the AT implementation plan um, reflect the capacity and resourcing in order to affect that change in to affect the in, uh, a noticeable speed reduction versus a uh, signage change. So, so, so to rephrase what you just said, the implementation plan for active transportation will be able to reduce traffic speeds. Uh, so the intent of the the intent of the neighborhood focus areas and the works that we the work that we would begin with um, uh, with the active route to school program a component of that is to look at traffic calming and speed reduction as as part of that work. Okay, I'll leave it there for now. Uh, go to Councillor Ostrov. Thank you for your report. Um, I'm I'm. I'm glad to see that you're combining the effort uh, in, in, in creating situations that will uh, encourage um, lower speed, uh, lower speeds, not just lowering uh, them again. Like I know in the rural area, uh, there's a lot of, uh, I, there's some requests to lower speed limits, but there's by far more requests not to lower speed limits. So um, for me, that's my experience uh, that, you know, there's still, but, I recognize what we're doing. Is there is there anything in here that kind of covers my area in the rural area that I, or besides school zones? I guess we monitor and and parks or or whatever. What, what do you know specifically that there's something, or is it generally targeted in urban areas? This. So the the road safety plan is it it, it covers the entirety of the city. Okay. So the emphasis areas those those seven areas plus the the school zone is intended to to cover the approach that's taken across the city. So the 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 countermeasure programs that are in place both from the city and from our road safety partners also apply across the city. And any changes that we would make uh, from the city's policy standpoint relative to intersection work or pedestrian crossovers and all those pieces would apply um, would apply both in the urban and the rural area uh, some of the work some of the specific project work that we're describing that would be part of the active transportation implementation plan are more are more focused in the suburban areas yeah. of the city uh, and and for for um, relative to where other work is planned Okay, and the second question, and maybe I'm um, out of, it's not in yours to answer, uh, maybe I should have asked it sooner, but in the, some of the data that we have um, accumulated, I know that we saw that on the road to zero, we saw so many um, injuries and, and, and deaths and, and accidents. Um, we don't, do we see the data of where, where it was five years ago? Are we seeing, uh, is, it, is it a graph that's actually increasing? Or um, we know what the way it is right now, but I'm just wondering how we, if if there's, um, can we make that synopsis that it's actually increasing and this is a crisis or something like that? Yeah, I think for for the purpose of what we can present tonight, this is here are the here are the numbers, the combined number injury plus fatal numbers that were that were looked at from 2012 to 2016. I think um, part of what is Part of what is also acknowledged in the report and in the work that the Road Safety Advisory Group and, and all of the partners were looking at is that the, this will take some time to, to, achieve the, to achieve the overall vision. And that that, you know, that the goal that has been set is to look for a progressive reduction um, that acknowledges the, that much of the work uh, relies on some on design changes and um, design changes along corridors and work at intersections and that is work that that takes time and resources in order to complete yep Councilor Senek thank you for you Mr. T my one question about roundabout so it says that we'll expand the use of roundabouts is that like in new roads or are we looking at taking an intersection that right now has traffic lights and turning it into a roundabout? 
I think those those specific details are uh, remain to be determined. I think the general is the general intent is that roundabouts are considered as a viable option as part of any new intersection or intersection redesign. Um, the work that is done um, along the city's main arterial and collector roads would look at that. But in particular, uh, the, the work that is envisioned for the neighborhood areas uh, and the way in which we can um, address some of the speed or, or crossing concerns as it, as it could relate to the roundabout or mini roundabout use. So the intent is, the intent is that we would use, that, that the roundabout would be considered as part of that, um, as part of a, a potential upgrade that could be completed at any intersection. Okay, so right now we don't have a list of ones might turn into roundabouts. Um, for raised intersections that we heard in the delegation, I don't see that mentioned anywhere in the report. Um, is, it, is it part of what you classify as intersection improvements, or how come we don't talk at all in the 113-page report about raised, trying to implement raised intersections? Um, so I, again, a raised intersection is a is a type of treatment or or a design that we would look at um, look at as part of our intersection work. That um, the the map that I'm showing here now, what what I think what the road safety plan is intending is it 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 does speak to the design guidelines and the pieces that we would look at. And part of our work of, re involves reviewing all of the cities implementing policies and guidelines as it relates to as it relates to the right of way and to those aspects that would that would um, contribute to road safety from a specific intersection standpoint the the I think as a high level document it wasn't intended to identify where we would do those work where that work would be done and the type of work that we've done you will see that more at the in the implementation plan for for at um, there's 50 intersections that have been identified for some measure of treatment that need to occur with, with the um, creation of the, the citywide cycling and pedestrian corridors or with some of the neighborhood work that's envisioned. So all of these locations, this also shows the school crossings and, and other work. So these locations would all are all have the potential for some measure of upgrade or treatment. Uh, it might be as simple as, um, you know, bike boxes and pedestrian crossover additions um, and some signal changes, or it, or it could involve, you know, the full reconstruction of an intersection like what's, like what's planned for King and Portsmouth in 2020. Thank you. And your section in the report talks about um, the pedestrian crossovers. Um, you talk about the type D PXO. So right now, our crossovers that we have, they're all legalized now, like I think we had nine across the city, something like that, but they're all flashing, right? They all have the flashing beacons, or, or which ones don't? Um, and then that leads into my yeah. other questions. Okay. Yeah, so I think, so the, with the new guidelines from the province, the, the first, I think the first way in which the city implemented those was to convert the courtesy crossings into that new into the new um, types. So the types that you see out with uh, the flashing lights are what for, are, are what are referred to as a type B. Uh, so the those locations, the nine or ten, eight eight locations that were converted um, are type B. There are two type D locations uh, in the city that were installed this year along the KMP Trail. So um, you would see examples of it at Hickson and St. Remy Place. Um, these the, were the, the city, and I think from a design standpoint, we were comfortable in sort of implementing those cro that type D crossover in those locations based on the volumes and, and other aspects of, of the transportation network in that area. The work that we're proposing to do in looking at the type D, because the the type D does provide a, a very expeditious and economical, economical way in which we can add additional legal crossovers for all pedestrians in the city. 
Um, however, it's, it's a new tool and we wanna make sure that we approach it in the right way and in the safe way and that it, it's coupled with the, again, much like not just reducing speed limits, it's coupled with the right education and enforcement and other tools that need to go along with it. So what we'd like to see as part of the type D aspect is what, what is the way in which we can implement these in the urban and suburban areas such that it could be done in a, in a way that is, um, uh, that is the most meaningful. Okay, thank you. So on with that, um, so you're talking about the PXO type D that would be for medium to low traffic volume, single load or single lane roadways. So in my district, we know across from Bay Ridge Park going over Bay Ridge Drive or Collins Bay Road, they would not be appropriate, right? We would still want the flashing. They wouldn't, Bay Ridge Drive and Collins Bay Road, they mm -hmm. would not be considered to be medium to low traffic single lane roadways, would they? Uh, so uh, generally, no. So uh, th in certainly those two stations that you're referencing, um, uh, Taylor Kid and Bay Ridge Park, um, that location as an existing school crossing is being evaluated this year to determine the appropriate infrastructure that we would put in place to make it um, an upgraded crossover for pedestrians. Um, the type D crossover would not generally be used in those areas. Yeah. Thanks, yeah, the flashing lights. My next question is, um, so when we're talking about the number of accidents, right, 359 accidents, or like collisions per year for injury or fatalities, do we have a list of what those intersections are? Like, I was just wondering, the police, they gave us data 10 years ago that showed, you know, um, Princess Street and Gardner's Road, for example, I think is number one in the city. I don't know if it is because we haven't had any updated numbers. So in those intersections that have those accidents, where um, the accident's a pretty even mix of what you call rear ends, turning movement, mm -hmm angle, like the reason the accident was caused by angle. I don't know what that really means, but so is it a pretty even mix or could you see like that this particular intersection had a super high number of turning movement accidents? So I was kind of hoping we would get that sort of data. So since we didn't, that's my question. Uh, yeah, so all that information, it's actually available to, um, to everyone, to the public as well, uh, on the on the city's um, road safety website. So there's a dynamic map um, that's available that maps all of the data points that were part of um, part of the study are included there. And the intent of the annual road safety um, report that would be brought back would be to provide updated information and analysis of of where where those collisions occurred um, and, and some comparison as we can. Great, and to terminology question and then that's it. Um, when you say leading pedestrian jump intervals at traffic signals, what does that mean? So um, Deanna can jump in if I misrepresent this, but essentially it means that the pedestrian gets a, a walk uh, symbol um, before the light turns green for the vehicles. So an example of this you can see at um, Johnson and Ontario Street. So if you're standing on, if you're standing at the corner of Johnson and Ontario and go to cross Ontario, you'll get a, um, you'll get a walk symbol before the vehicles get um, a green light. Thank you very much. Other members of the committee, Councillor Doherty. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. The, when, when, the, when you had the large visioning process, uh, including the various groups that were involved, did anybody bring up um, the introduction of bollards at Sir John A to reduce the, the width of the road and make cycling safer there? So, um as part of the road safety plan work with the road, sorry, as part of the work with the road safety advisory group, um, they, they they didn't focus on specific projects. Again, looking to create the emphasis areas and the countermeasure programs that could be identified. Uh, Sir John A. Macdonald um, 
as a, as a cycling corridor, corridor was cert, was, did certainly come up as part of the active transportation uh, work that was done. Uh, so along that corridor, um, there's, there's um, uh, a, multi, a separated um, in Boulevard Trail, so a, a multi-use path that's envisioned for the east side of Sir John and McDonald to extend um, from, from King Street North. Uh, the other change, specific changes, like interim changes um, related to bollards and, and other components along that particular corridor um, were not addressed in the road safety plan and um, are, do not form part of the, the AT implementation plan for this term as it, as it exists right now. It focuses on the long-term addition of a multi-use path. Along the same, I also have a question about data. Do uh, I noticed 2014 seemed to be a low year with accidents? Was that? Uh, do we also track what kind of weather we have and how much is related to snow plowing and winter storms? Variable every year, and weather often plays a huge role in that. So when we get those Kingston Police reports. Our database does track uh, not only the cause, um, the, the driver action, the weather, the pavement surface, the lighting. So we do have the ability to track that data, but there's a number of factors that impact each collision. Sometimes they're random, and that's why you see that fluctuation from year to year, and that's why we look at a minimum of five years to establish any type of pattern. Just one more question, and more of a process question. So, um, if we, if if council supports the implementation plan, including um, all the the proposals that and that we've discussed tonight, and I notice a few cycle paths, and you're talking about the di different connections between the cycle paths. But if in a in a couple of years down the road. We, we kind of have better ideas, a bit more research. You, you mentioned that the collision data takes a while to collect. Um, how flexible is this? Or are we then set for the plan for the next five years and any councillor coming up with a new idea or, or a higher needs area, perhaps? Um, so I, I, I was just asking about flexibility. Certainly. So I think a road safety plans standpoint, it, we, we, the intent is to look at it um, in, in five-year increments in, in the way you would look at the emphasis areas and the countermeasure programs that are, that are in place and those that support that. The, the projects that will come forward as part of the AT plan, it, it lays out uh, um, specific projects that can be accomplished over the five years. Uh, and the and the funding that goes along with that from a capital and from a resource standpoint. If we if there is a desire to add additional projects into that plan, either at the, at the time when the plan is brought or at or at other points through council's term, um, that certainly council's prerogative, and we and staff can provide information about the ways in which that could be done. However, it would it would either come at projects that are contained in there shifting out um, to later dates uh, or, or adding resourcing in order to be able to do that. But, I'm, but I always enjoy hearing councillor ideas at any time. Yeah, so I, further to that, because uh, it's process, so this if passed uh, the recommendations, the two recommendations in the package, and we're not there yet, but I'm just going to ask, because it's relevant to the last question. So if passed, it, it says several times it's a high-level document, mm -hmm. strategic document, um, but the specifics are essentially the two groups, the Transportation Public Works and the Active Transportation Implementation Plan, I guess, if that's a group, I don't know if that's a separate group or if that's mm -hmm. part of of the same group, but those are the sort of two aspects. On, that's correct, right? So on the transportation and public works work, specifically, you've got, you had one slide there, yeah. So, so there's the 
the active transportation implementation, in implementation plan, which is, as you've said, the way that we create the networks from the point of view of the active transportation user. Yep. When they intersect with the vehicular traffic systems, such as at a pedestrian crossover, uh, that, that will be a point where everything is affected. So the, the, the improvements that are put in through the active trans transportation implementation plan will necessarily reduce traffic speed, both because there might be a crossing stopping traffic or because of other infrastructure improvements that have to do with the pedestrian crossover. So that part is very clear from reading the report. So that's a tangible. But I'm wondering, other than the improvements to do with the active transportation plan, what specifically is the engineering and transportation public works groups, what is in the plan for the next five years to reduce traffic speed specifically? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So I think, yes, so to, to clarify, the, um, the AT, the implementation plan for active transportation is, is a part of the transportation and public works work plan. There are, there are other works that are, that are a component of that that largely relate to um, road repair and reconstruction projects. Um, that would be that would form that well that have formed part of council strategic priorities and would be discussed as part of budget and other work plan items. I'm just looking to Commissioner Kidd to confirm that. Through you, you Chair. Um, yes. Yeah, so when I, probably the easiest way to think about all of this work. Uh, so this is the high level uh, plan that the concepts will all be integrated into all of the work that we do be it road design right down to, to uh, maintenance. And so, um, yes, we, we will make sure, because transportation and public works includes engineering, as you've indicated, uh, we will make sure that the work plans for all of those groups are partnering to fulfill the commitments in the implementation plan, both from the beginning of design and redesign through to maintenance in the focus areas and the neighborhood areas that are targeted. So, so does that answer the question? That's the question, and I saw it. But it's just difficult to sink our teeth into it uh, on our end that we're, when we're explaining this to, to our prospective residents of our various districts, they're going to ask us, well, what, what's going to change about the roads? And we're not, we don't really have an answer at this point. Um, it's going to be gradually... In, it's gonna, this plan is going to gradually inform the new design work, but there's nothing specific here that says we're going to have more roundabouts in these locations other than what we've identified in the active transportation implementation plan, which, which does go into specifics. So like to use that as a parallel example, so when that came here, it, it was also Mr. Semple, and it was, it was clear like there's one thing to have active transportation network, but another one is to have the implementation plan, and that goes neighborhood by neighborhood, and the details st still needed to be determined and fleshed out in consultation with, with residents. But I don't, I don't see that kind of thing happening with the general road reconstruction. So what determines the design of the general road reconstruction, and is anything going to change? Like, and how do we know it's going to change, and how, are the, how do we explain it to the residents? Through you, Ms. Ms. Um, so we're, uh, you, you don't have that information because we haven't yet been able to define it. So we're, we're just in the first six months of bringing these groups together. Um, I think when you get the AT implementation plan in September, there will be specifics, and, and at budget time there will be specific projects. So, um, in my new uh, experience with having the engineering department uh, coupled together with, with public works and transportation, what we're trying to do is make sure that we are all thinking along the same lines and following those, those guidelines and principles so that whatever engineering might have in their work plans and any road uh, redesign 
uh, project uh, generally involves an EA process, which is a, a very lengthy process with lots of consultation to, to solve a particular problem. But what we are making sure is that, that those designs are always prioritizing uh, the safety for pedestrians and cyclists, and that they're, we're not just redesigning roads um, because that's basically what, what we've done for a number of years. Yes, we've added cycling lanes, and yes, we've added uh, some features into it, but, but I think it's, we're, we're going to take that to a new level. So I, I wish I had a more definitive answer for you right now. Um, I would say in the very early phase, it's a shift in the way we think about things in, in a more collaborative way to, to actually commit to doing those things from the design stage um, that, uh, that will help us achieve the targets in the transportation master plan for pedestrian and cycling for active transportation and the, the uh, targets for uh, road safety in this plan. And when, I'm just guessing here, so when um, some of this work has been completed, when engineering has uh, been able to incorporate some of these features that are, that are suggested, because I, I read this as kind of like a tool kit that with all the different uh, possible options that can be used, and some of them is road redesign. That point, although identified in the plan, it hasn't filtered through the departments as far as what that looks like in reality yet, is that's what I'm hearing from you. But when something is identified, it will come, I guess it'll, it, it will be reported at budget time with the with the specifics of, of where what the engineering group is doing or would it would there be separate reports that come into this committee um, through you mr. chair uh, so at budget time most certainly the engineering group will present uh, their budget and there will be specifics around uh, road rehabilitation um, I don't uh, I, I don't think we have anything specific for, for 2020 around uh, road redesigns, because those are much larger projects and, and can often take several years through the EA process. Um, I think if, if you can think about a report that we brought to Council of Months that spoke to the uh, John Counter Boulevard project and the completion of that with the last phase, um, where we were able to have some influence on on the design of at least which side the sidewalk would be on and, and planning for future changes. So those are the types of, of ways that we're trying to affect those things. And we're trying to, to again, look at it in an integrated way. So we'll give you as much detail at, at budget time as we can with regard to specific roads that we're going to do, um, the, the specific intersection upgrades, uh, the specific neighborhoods that we plan to focus on in, in the AT plan. So, so all of that will come to the extent that we know it today. And I, and I think to, to add that the, the vast majority of the work that is anticipated in 2020, 21, and 22 is it be, with the exception of the road rehabilitation aspects, is largely contained in the AT plan as it's shown in, in what we're bringing forward. If I could give uh, perhaps one more example, help shed some, some light on, I know it's a long-term change and it's sort of a slow shift, but if we think about um, the work that was planned for, for Bay Ridge Drive, uh, the, our engineering group had a, had a road project planned for Bay Ridge Drive between Princess and Cedarwood that was going to straighten that road out and uh, rehabilitate the road. And um, when we were at council priorities, I did explain this, but I know there was a ton of information that night. So we, we now as a new group have taken a look at that and said, well, wait a second. If you, if you proceed with that project in the way that it's currently envisioned, first of all, you're going to eliminate the ability for us to add a multi-use pathway along that section, which is identified in the transportation plan. So that's problematic. Secondly, the, the project is designed at, at 
as it was designed um, would have only covered up to the intersection at Princess Street and, and Cedarwood. And we said, hang on, there's more to it than straightening out that section of road. We need to consider the intersection at Princess and Bay Ridge because it's a very, very busy intersection. And we need to actually go beyond that uh, to the intersection at Woodbine and incorporate it. And we need to go the other way and think about the intersection at Cedarwood and how, when we get our path, how people will move through that area in a safe way. So those are, those are the types of discussions that we're having and this work around the safety and around the active transportation plan are all starting to influence those road projects so that we get that more holistic look at it with the right priorities and, and the outcomes that, that we need instead of a straighter road that would simply increase speeds through there where there's already speed complaints from a, from a daycare that exists along that stretch. That, that's what we're trying to get to. Thank you. All right, well, I guess th that's the briefing, uh, unless there's any other questions. Oh, Councillor Hutchinson, sorry, I did not see your hand. Go ahead. I sat over there because I didn't mean to fight with these people. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> They're a good lot. Um, I just have a couple of questions, a couple of clarification, and, and then um, one, one is the 359 collisions involving injury and fatal uh, results. Is that an average? Because I didn't see 359 up on the list. It sounded like an average. Yes, just uh, so I know. Three, three minutes here. that's okay. an average of okay. from 2012 to 2016. Right. And do you know how many collisions of all sorts that we have? I don't have the exact number with me. Thousands. So typically um, around 70% or more of our collisions result in property damage only. So the number that we see tonight is actually a relatively small percentage of all of the collisions that occur. Right. I think that's important. Um, it sort of falls a bit from what uh, Councillor Ustroff was talking about is explain to people why we need to do these things, that it actually enhances the road experience for everyone, including people in vehicles. And road design does that. It makes it safer for everyone. And so I'm just thinking, how do we sell this thing, right, in political terms? So if we can say, um, you know, 70%, so, is uh, not that way. So 30% is, you divide by 30, I'll get a number and multiply it, and I'll get there, right? So, um, so that seems to be the math. So I think that's important. It should include that. And I, I saw that you were selling it, you know, for on the active transportation side. I think you should also sell it on the vehicle side. And you'll see in a minute, because I've had traffic calming, like a number of other people, uh, councillors, but I'm really interested in the perverse behavior that comes out of these things and how we treat it. For, so for example, here's my next question. Uh, and this comes right out of my Rideau Street experience, which we spent like years figuring out, right? And that is if 10 to 15% of drivers ignore the speed limit at 50 kilometers of an hour, does the percentage of drivers ignoring, ignoring the speed limit increase as the posted speed limit goes down? In other words, if it's 15% at 50 kilometers and you put it down to 40, is, there, is it now 20% of the drivers are not ignoring the speed limit or 25%? And that's a whole other problem at which I've been listening to um, traffic engineering for years now, and these problems come up all the time. So I'm just interested getting prepared with an answer to what, how that we're gonna, what, what that is, what the problem actually is, and how we're gonna deal with it. Do you have an answer to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll answer that one. So every street would be different when we go out and we do these traffic uh, speed studies. As you know, we always talk about the 85th percentile speed, which, which provides the operating speed, which means 15% drive faster than that, 85% drive that speed or less. 
Um, what we have found, unfortunately, and I think this is what you're referring to over the years, every single time that we have reduced the posted speed limit, so whether it's from 60 to 50, as we did on Sir John A, or other residential areas where we've gone from 50 to 40, the operating speed has remained unchanged. So I think what you're saying rings true. I, I can't say the exact percentage that it would be, but certainly if 15% are going over that posted speed limit and the speed limit is 50, certainly if it were posted at 40, we would expect the operating speed to remain unchanged. So unless we make drastic changes in that road design or there is heavy, heavy enforcement. So hence you're correct and you say the percent of motors who would be driving over the posted speed limit would definitely increase if we were to reduce the posted speed limit on its own. Exactly. Okay, good, because that Dr. Capon said, mm -hmm. the design is number one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yet another way of thinking about this a little more deeply. Um, now, sidewalks, there's a terrific debate going on in Toronto about people who do not want sidewalks. And you had right at the top on one of your slides here, sidewalk gaps. Mm -hmm. Now to me, this is odd at the best, okay? You don't want a sidewalk in your neighborhood, all right? So that tends to undermine everything we're trying to do here. So have we, maybe it's a Toronto thing, it's definitely centered in Etobicoke and we know who comes from there. So when you were doing your consultations and you've been doing them for years, have we had any issues like that that we need to prepare for? Like as politicians, that I don't want a sidewalk, I don't see why anybody needs a sidewalk, all this sort of stuff. Uh, through Chair, uh, short answer, yes. So it, it, I, it is not just a Toronto or an Etobicoke issue. So in identifying where gaps exist in our sidewalk network, um, that's, that's one aspect of the exercise physically putting the sidewalk in, um, in especially in established neighborhoods, um, particularly if it impacts um, the length of a driveway where a resident may have been parking a vehicle. Now that vehicle is technically parked on city property uh, or municipal right of way, but in shortening the, the introduction of a sidewalk uh, inherently shortens the driveway. Um, that's there, and that is the that that would be the greatest resistance that that we receive. Uh, either that you've you've taken away a parking space that I have, or that my my vehicle no longer fits in the parking space that exists, even if that land actually is is technically municipal land. So that that is a component that that we dealt with as part of the uh, AT consultation. And um, there's new sidewalks that are going in this year um, in Cataraqui um, Woods along uh, Birchwood, um, where, we're, where we dealt with this issue with the residents. Um, we, we found that the best approach with that is having a, having a master plan that identifies where those gaps are, informing the residents early and having some consultation and engagement with them to understand what their concerns may be, and then providing them information through the process. But it also involves a willingness to move forward with the plan, with the priorities that are set, and, and prioritizing pedestrians over vehicle parking. Okay, that's good to be reminded of all that, and good to know it's happening in Kingston as well. Mm -hmm. um, so because those people become uh, vulnerable to ticketing too. Because you're uh, not allowed to park over the sidewalk. That, yes, uh, to, to mean, that end. You get what, that downtown, right? What it becomes is, um, it be, what it can unfortunately become is an issue that then becomes an enforcement issue because you have behaviors of some residents and then you have other residents who are looking to use the sidewalk, accessibility needs and other aspects that where that, that conflict occurs and the city's bylaws and are quite clear that a sidewalk must remain unobstructed. One uh, question on roundabouts. In the process, I know Councillor Neil and I have had to do this numbers of times, is 
it's sort of like having a roundabout is you consult the neighborhood. And to some extent, it's we're looking for acquiescence mm -hmm. in the neighborhood to accept the roundabout. Based on the way I read the report, it seemed to me we were going to you know, more and more take that away. Mm -hmm. If we follow what Mr. Kapon was saying, we would be saying, no, this is the most efficient way to do things. This is, fits into our sustainability plans, our necessity to do all that sort of thing. So we're not going to let you say yay or nay anymore. It's changed. Like, I've been on council a long time now, so yep. it used to be much more, yeah, we'll take it. We'll go along with it. And I know in, in Councillor Neal's area, we had one, and then they reneged on it. And I know in my area, we had one taken right out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I just want to know how we're, what we're philosophy, how's our philosophy on this now? Are we basically we're saying, we've identified a roundabout as necessary here, and we're going to do it? So we're just telling you as a matter of course. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, three to share. So I think, I think there's a couple of components to that. Um, when we, what is referenced in the report um, refers to sort of a review of the city's traffic calming policy. So when we're talking about a roundabout in a neighborhood, those are one of, the, that treatment is one of the tools that we use for traffic calming. And you are, Yes, I think the way that you characterize it, it is correct. There, there is an aspect of the city's traffic calming policy that seeks agreement from the neighborhood that this is the type of piece that they would like to put in. There, however, at, at times that can be to, to the detriment of speed reduction. And so the philosophy, it's not the philosophy, the, the approach that Vision Zero's sort of requires is that you would be looking to put the design features in place that most that that address the issue of speed or of road safety overall in in the best way that doesn't mean that the city wouldn't engage and consult on what that would look like and all of those components and we wouldn't consider public the public consultation and um, information that's provided as part of that decision. But we want to, part of that review of the traffic calming policy is to look at, to look at that aspect of it. It's also to look at the way in which we're approaching traffic calming, which, which from a tool standpoint, when it's done in isolation, often, often shifts the problem or can shift the problem to a neighboring block. It's the same, uh, it's a similar approach in the way from a parking regulation standpoint, if you restrict it on one block, just head one block over and you'll find those cars, right? So I think from our standpoint, again, that, that review and the way in which we would look at traffic calming, again, would be, we would want to look at it at a, at a broader or an, a more of a neighborhood level and that we would consider all of those pieces and present that as a whole plan that most that that provides the the plan that greatest in the that addresses the concern in the best way and that could include a variety of different treatments but but yes there will need to be there needs to be policy and and political will to to a, to allow for that change to happen in a neighborhood level that may not that may come at the detriment of the of a sidewalk going into someone's front yard or a change in an intersection design that that may not be preferred by an individual. Thank you. That's good to hear. We'll see you later. <laughs> All right, well, we'll move along to the, uh, thank you very much for all of your excellent answers and for the, um, the work so far and for the briefing. We're going to move along to the next item, which is the actual item of business of the, you can, you can stay in your spot because there may be more questions. Um, so the 7A, uh, or you can, you, yeah, yeah, maybe stay near a microphone, I guess. Um, so the City of Kingston Road Safety Plan so there's the report, right? And then there's a recommendation with uh, essentially two clauses, right? 
that we see there. So we need um, to ask, well, you. So questions from members of the committee, would Norma come first? We've all had a lot of time on the briefing there. So, and when, when it's on the floor, you can still ask questions. So I'm gonna go right to members of the public asking questions on the report. Uh, to st to, and then after all of the members of the public have spoken, staff can respond to all the questions. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I want to praise the quality and the effort that's gone into the report. Um, I know it's been an extensive period of time on it. Um, like a lot of good work has been done. Um, I have 25 points, and I'm not going to get them all in, so I'm going to concentrate on maybe half a dozen and write the whole thing up and put it in as a letter to the committee. I think I'll put it into council in general because it's a wide interest uh, on this. So what I am going to start with is what I see as a bit of a shortfall in the stat type analysis. What you have is good. I think it's missing areas of, for example, seasonal um, breakdown, right? Say spring, summer, fall, winter, and say month by month. So you have, obviously you have that data, but it hasn't been presented. So that's very important to have. And I think having all of the collision data brought in with the ones that just cause injury or death is very important as well. So you, uh, as we heard, 70% of the collisions don't involve injury or death. So bringing that into the picture, I think is very important to have. Um, we've seen e-scooters in Kingston. I've seen them, right? So that's not talked about. And things like a stunt, stunting of bicycles on the sidewalk and that kind of thing. Um, the enforcement there, I think, could be improved. So I, my question is, we, we had some, some discussion on enforcement. If you increase the enforcement, what's the impact on the traffic safety? I'm not sure if that's come up specifically, so that's a point I want to make. Um, if we increase transit service, I know there's been a big upsurge in transit uh, patronage the last few years, and everyone is to be congratulated for that. But there are areas of the city that don't have transit, north of the 401, uh, Westbrook Airport, those sort of areas. We get vehicles off the road, and we increase our safety that way. So I know um, past councils have been committed to improving transit service, so I'll be uh, putting that one in. Um, we speak about roundabouts, and what was presented in the delegation was tremendous, but Netherlands is not Canada when it comes to winter, right? I have Dutch background, I visited the Netherlands myself, so I've seen some of the work they've done there. That's not considered in the scholarly part, because you didn't examine the Netherlands or, say, Denmark. But in Canada, we need wider roads because we have winter conditions, and we need places for snow to be piled up when it's plowed. So, Roundabouts take more space. I'm in favor of them myself. We could update our data set with 2017, 2018 as we go forward. We have 2012, 2016. So that data is available. It should be included, I think, in the, the package of um, just the material we'll be able to look at. We got a number of arterials in the older part of the city there in very poor shape. Now, the city did fantastic work on division at Princess, right, as part of the phase four big dig project. So that was a very bad area for traffic safety, and it's much better now, right? You have bike lanes clearly indicated. The pavement is vastly better. So the, the older areas like King, Johnson, Union, Brock, Princess, Queen, and Montreal. Queen is terrible. It is just unsafe. So. Um, and then uh, fitting in the improved street design with the newer development areas. That, that needs to be emphasized a bit more. And I know Councillor Oosterhoff has been raising points on rural road safety. We have a lot of rural roads that are in very poor shape. So I know that's part of the plan to try to fix that. 
So I think those are the points I'm emphasizing, and um, I'm not sure there's a lot of questions there. I'm, I'm sure staff's aware of all this, but I think that the scope of the report needs to be broadened a little bit and to get more uh, data-specific information in there. So thank you. And I invite uh, Mr. Dixon to submit uh, your written uh, points. Uh, you can circulate it to council. I'm sure the clerks will help you with that. Thank you. Any other members of the public? Please. Hi. Thanks. Uh, Roger Healy from Beverly Street. I, uh, I just wanted to mention a couple of things. Um, uh, I, I think it's, it's terrific that, that uh, the road safety plan is, is being uh, incorporated into the active transportation implementation plan, and, and I think those, those things are very logical and make a lot of sense. Um, I, I wanted to add that, that speed reduction really is the, the elephant in the room in a sense. Uh, I know that car, car driving public don't, don't like to think about slowing down. But um, in a lot of ways, if you, if you do the simple math, you can get across the city in virtually the same amount of time at a slower speed. So uh, it's, it's a hard, hard thing to uh, get your head around. But I've been trying in the past few days to, or past few weeks to drive at the speed limit. <laughs> and there are some roads where it's just impossible to to stay at the speed limit, and I'm thinking of, say, front road, to do 60 and see all the cars zooming by me, and I'm, I'm, I'm holding up traffic by doing that. So anyway, I, I just wanted you to, to, to spend some time thinking about uh, what it really means. So, you know, a five kilometer trip at 60K, you can do it in five minutes. No, no stopping, of course. Uh, but at, at 50K, it's really only six minutes. <laughs> and at 40K, it's seven and a half minutes. So, you know, in, for that two and a half minutes, you, you could easily lose that in, in stoplights and, and so on. Uh, and I think, as a few of you have mentioned, traveling at a slower speed is not only safer, it's better for the environment because it doesn't cost you as much in fuel. Um, um, the second thing I wanted to just sort of mention is that, you know, we throw around these numbers like 359 collisions average, but you, you have to stop and think about just how devastating that is for the individuals, the families, the, the economy. These people are out of work for periods of time. Uh, incapacitated for long periods of time and, and maybe um, uh, suffer diseases or, or injuries that, that last for a long, long time. So it's, it's really important to just focus on, on that big a number and the possibility to reduce it is, is really very meaningful. Anyway, thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Healy. Any other members of the public wish to speak? Yeah. Just come to a microphone, please. Hi, Hal Kane, and um, I just really wanted to kind of reinforce what a lot was already being said, and. Um, as, you, as a lot of you know, I'm quite involved with the cycling community and cycling safety around Kingston. Um, I want to applaud the work that's been done so far by the uh, engineering and other departments. Um, I think one of the things that, and I keep hearing the low fruit, um, you know, as we roll this out. So I guess my only comment is, and having heard tonight and thinking over is, um, you know, some of this is, uh, I know it's a long range plan, but I think that maybe a reevaluation of what some of the lo low hanging fruit is. Uh, in particular, the existing infrastructure to repair it. I know the bollards have gone up and those seem to, to be uh, working very well and this type of thing, but just road surfaces and other things that can make cycling a little bit more safer around the city, and I'm talking in particular about cycling. 
Um, repair of sidewalks also for pedestrians. I know the other hat that I wear in rehabilitation just for getting uh, people that don't even use assistive devices but uneven sidewalks and those type of things. So I guess um, looking at it from uh, you know, just calling attention to remind that the stuff that we have already in place that could work a lot better if it was just repaired. Uh, but again, I'm wholeheartedly in favor of things, especially roundabouts, 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 roundabouts. So um, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public that wish to speak? So. Um, we'll go to staff to respond to uh, the members of the public. If there was any questions. Or um, I, I have uh, two, that the questions that I heard just related to uh, uh, questions around whether increased enforcement um, and increased transit use had an impact on traffic safety. I don't have information that we can share on that, but that, that certainly would be part of the um, analysis that we would be doing with the annual road safety report that we would bring um, in looking at collisions and other data pieces. The other aspect related to the uh, collision information for 2017 and 2018, um, again, those, those numbers and, and ongoing annually will provide that information both as part of the report and, and as part of the public portal that we've po uh, populated with that, that data. Great, thank you. So we need a mover and a seconder for the recommendations. We can get it on the floor. Moved by Councillor Holland, second by Councillor Doherty. I'll read it out. That the EITP committee recommend to Council that Council endorse the road safety plan included as Exhibit A in report number EITP 19-008 and that Council, in support of the findings and principles included within the road safety plan, direct staff to incorporate the city-led countermeasures outlined in the road safety plan into the Active Transportation Five-Year Implementation Plan and the Annual Work Plans of the Transportation and Public Works Group. Moved and seconded. Does anyone wish to speak? Councillor Neal. Just one quick one I should have asked before. Um, are there, within the urban boundary, are there any roads that still have 60 kilometer speed limit on it, other than maybe the entrance point of Sir John A? Are there, is everything else uh, the default 50 kilometer? No, there would be default that would be posted at 60. So we would see that on pieces of Gardner's Road, parts of Bay Ridge. Um, we, we'd have to go back and look at our bylaw, but certainly not all of the roads in the urban boundary are 50. Okay. Um, so we've we've um, yeah we're at uh, deliberations. So maybe before we vote, we maybe be clear about what exactly it is that recommendation recommendation is saying. So maybe I'll phrase this as a question to staff, and you can just confirm. So the. The road safety plan is this document that's in the appendix, and it was prepared by the consultant, and it, can, it contains a lot of useful information, um, but the, the specific implementation of it is a separate thing, and that's what's spoken to in the second clause. And in the second clause, we see that uh, the recommendation is to direct staff to incorporate the city-led countermeasures. So, so that's, by city-led, that means countermeasures as identified by staff based on the report? Is that what that means? Uh, through, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, no, that is specific to the countermeasures that are led, that are led um, by the city. The, there are a number of countermeasures in the document that are led by other road safety partners that we cannot c compel them um, through this motion to do anything with. Thanks for clarifying that. So like, yeah, with the exclusion of the enforcement uh, things like um, that, that the police would be enforcing, which is an external agency or public health. So with the exclusion of those, the ones that are city led that are identified in the report. So it's direct staff to incorporate these into the active transportation 
implementation plan and the annual work plans of the Transportation Public Works Group. And we heard from Ms. Kidd's answers earlier that that last part is essentially still to be determined as to the, the specifics. So it, we're directing staff also to, to do that work, I guess, to identify where these countermeasures can be added to the annual work plans. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, yes, and I, um, so within the report, um, the specific countermeasures, you will see them referred to as existing, expanded, or new. Um, so there are, a variety, there are a variety of programs that are in place right now that the city operates um, and that our partners operate. W within the, so the intent would be to incorporate all of those continuing and ongoing into, into the city's work plan. Uh, within the active transportation implementation plan, um, th there are various countermeasures that are expanded as part of that um, program, notably around uh, the uh, safer, more active routes to schools and a number of aspects around the young, younger, younger demographic school zones and education. Um, as the city expands into it, uh, expands from building and maintaining infrastructure to the education and um, other engagement aspects that we spoke to, um, and the, and then the second part of that recommendation would then would then or uh, that second recommendation sp speaks to the the components that Miss Kidd was speaking to about there are um, road design guidelines there are. Um, the pedestrian crossover work and the other components that we outline in the report that we're looking to update to reflect the road safety plans um, uh, approach. And that last bit we heard would be for, there's nothing in the 2019 work plan, but it would be for the 2020, starting with the 2020 work plan, is that right? Um, so, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, speci specific to this report, it speaks to the review of the traffic calming policy and the pedestrian crossover work, which uh, I believe outline a completion in 2021 uh, for delivery back to council. The the remaining the remaining um, policy and implementation guideline pieces that again are outlined in in the report um, do not have a timeline associated with them yet. But the intent is that they would be updated to, re to uh, reflect the road safety approach in the future. Okay, great. And I guess final question about the traffic calming review. Does this mean that uh, the current and maybe the ones that might come up this year from the district, uh, we have this two, uh, two streets can be identified by a district councillor on a yearly basis for review by staff for traffic calming measures. Would that continue while this is under review? Uh, through, you, through you, Mr. Chair, yes. So I think while the policy is under review, that it would, we would continue with the, the current policy, um, but certainly open to having those discussions about the ways in which that can be reflected in any review that we do. Okay, well, now I need to ask the vice chair to take the chair so I can speak. As a committee member. I take the chair. Recognize you. Thank you. Uh, and this is actually an amendment uh, that I'd like to introduce. It's, it's very straightforward. So, uh, Mr. Clerk, it's the first clause that I sent you, not the second. So, that the City of Kingston make a true committee commitment, that the City of Kingston make a true commitment to Vision Zero by setting an inspiration goal, an inspirational goal of zero pedestrian fatalities by vehicles. It's like, it, it's in the plan. Vision Zero is referenced a lot in the plan, but we didn't actually, council hasn't said anything about Vision Zero yet. We're just endorsing a road safety plan that references Vision Zero. So I thought if we added a clause that actually explains what Vision Zero is and, said, and, and makes a commitment to it, the, the goal of zero pedestrian fatalities by vehicles, it's only part of Vision Zero, but it's the, it's the part I think that's the most uh, I, I think it needs to be, it can be reworded if you, if you like, but I think we need to put something about Vision Zero in the recommendation. That's why I've made the amendment. Okay, so the clerk has the amendment. Yep. It's moved and seconded? Okay. No, I, well, I, I, 
I, I, I have put you down, Councilor Holland, as a seconder, but I can ask someone else if you like. Okay. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Okay, so the amendment uh, moved by Councillor Stroud, seconded by Councillor Holland, um, that this following clause be added to the... It's just one clause. That the clause be added to the beginning, uh, the beginning yeah. of the recommendation? Yeah. Okay, so that the first part of the recommendation would read that the city of Kingston make a true commitment to Vision Zero by setting an inspirational goal of zero pedestrian fatalities by vehicles. Uh, okay, so staff would like to speak to this. Go, go ahead, uh, Mr. Through you, Mr. Just uh, a clarification around the terminology. Within the, within the report and the plan, there is a vision, which is a long-term vision, and there is a, and the goal that is set is a five-year goal. So I, just to, to clarify that it, the, uh, the longer term approach would be a vision and the report speaks to a five year goal. So the word goal is... is the, um, yeah, through, uh, I would put forward that the word goal may create some confusion if depending on what your intent of, of this is. It, it could be um, interpreted with, with this approach that um, this, the intent would be that the city has zero pedestrian fatalities by vehicles within five years. So the interpretation as is would be with no time, with no time um, indicated is, the, is, the, is problematic, is, is that what you're saying? Or that it's contradictory? Um, yeah, and I think that's for, for committee to discuss, but I just, I want you to be aware that in the context of the report, mm -hmm. goal is associated with a five-year time frame, and vision is associated with a longer-term time frame. Okay. So, um, Councillor Stout, are you interested in adding a time frame to this amendment? This, this amendment? I think in replace the word goal, it may be to remove the ambiguity uh, and, and maybe put as soon as possible, which is a vague but specific. Uh, the, the truth is there's, there's an element of luck to, uh, to casualties, and the year that we get zero will be, will be a, a, a great year, but there's no way we can predict when that's going to be. Okay. But I'm open, I'm open to suggestions of how to work sure. this. Okay, so Councillor Doherty. And I think we should add not also cyclists, right? Well, Try to keep it simple, but open to any suggestions. I don't want to make it too wordy. So. Councillor, I just have a... Can I just ask the intent of this? Can you explain the intent again? The it's simple is it's just this aspect of Vision Zero to put it in writing and make a commitment to the people of Kingston that also explains what Vision Zero is. If we don't spell it out, I'm telling you, people are not going to understand. People aren't going to be reading the report and know that it's based on Vision Zero. It doesn't say that, right? It's just a road safety plan. I mean, not just a road safety plan, it's a huge thing. But I mean, if we, if we want it to be Vision Zero, we have to say it. That's the point. So I'm, if it would be, um, 
I mean, given that this is asking, essentially it's asking council to make a commitment to Vision Zero uh, that is not expressed in this document, which might be something that we best brought forward as a motion to council that is separate from this road safety document, but is more a statement of commitment and vision and values. If it passes today, it will be the committee that's recommending it to council, and if it doesn't, I can, I suppose, I, if, unless there's rules, I could integrally add council. It made more sense here because we, we heard all of the presentations and we know what Vision Zero means, so I thought I'd introduce it here. Okay, Councillor Mr. Huff? Yeah, I, I appreciate the efforts here, but I, I think the intention is embedded in it, in its current format. Um, I think obviously staff's intention is to, um, I, I want to understand you, I'm not, um, that we're committed to Vision Zero. But the way it reads to me that Council City of Kingston make a true commitment and an inspirational goal and then it misses on the, on the, you know, pedest uh, fatalities by vehicles. I think we've done that. I think, I think it's doing that. Um, it's, 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 it's understood in my mind and uh, pro probably not necessary in my opinion right now. Birdie? Um, could I suggest a reading? I don't know if this would work, but that council endorsed the road safety plan, including as exhibit A in the report number, da, da, da. And the vision zero contained within because Vision Zero is inside the road safety plan, but then at least you're naming it and it's contained within the road safety plan. And that's it. Councillor Rosanek? So this is an amendment. I think what I would like is withdraw my amendment and have Councillor Doherty submit her amendment separately. Sounds good. Councillor Doherty, can you please put the clerk? Um, looking at the motion as is, in the first clause, after the first and, vision zero con contained within. Unless you want to move that up a little bit for me. Councillor Strouder, are you seconding this to amend? Um, we add the word and the vision zero contained within, then I would be happy with it. Okay, so moved by Councillor Doherty, seconded by Councillor Stroud. That the end of the first clause contain the addition, uh, add, or sorry, boy, reading while the screen is moving, it's really fun. Okay. Just give me one second. <laughs> okay, so that the, the first clause that the following words be added to the end of the first recommend clause, quote, and the commitment division zero contained within. So it's that's- It's technically the second clause, that's why I'm changing it, just to be okay. sure. We're all okay with that, I think. All right, so it's been moved and seconded. Any further comments on this amendment? Okay, seeing none, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed, carries. I return the chair. Thank you. Um, I just had a comment about the sort of very basic nature of what we're discussing. Kingston didn't start out uh, with as many vehicles, well, didn't start out with any vehicles. It started out before even, maybe I guess the vehicles that you attach to the back of a horse is what we started with. And at that time, there probably were discussions about safety when it started to get, like the downtown area started to have lots of horse and buggies going by, but it probably, the speeds were, never faster than maybe 20 kilometers an hour, so probably it wasn't really thought of. And so the road design that we're actually inheriting as in the city of Kingston, especially the old part, is actually predates the vehicle, the motor vehicle, which is essentially the problem. And then there's the whole 
um, tradition of, of the post-war years of, uh, of car infrastructure being, you know, go, go, go with the car infrastructure, expand, 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 which we did, and uh, North America benefited economically greatly by the transportation networks that we had. But nobody foresaw what would happen with population expansion and that one day we would run out of room and place for the cars and uh, pace of life will have increased to the point that, I mean, everyone knows, when you go to Toronto, everybody says the same thing. If you visit Toronto from a smaller municipality, it's like, it's crazy. It's crazy. Toronto's crazy. It's gone so crazy. I don't go to Toronto anymore. You hear these comments, right? And why is that? Toronto is actually a pretty interesting place. We still go there, but we probably go there as little as possible. And the very first thing we're thinking about is how am I going to get there safely? There's the 401, there's the gardeners, you know, DVP. It's all dangerous and it's all speed plus volume, right? The 401 especially, speed plus volume. So we don't have Toronto's problem yet. Uh, and we inherited this old infrastructure, but what we do have is a car culture that everybody in North America has. And the problem with cars is that they condition us to take things for granted, such as pedestrian safety, such as our own safety. If you've never been in a car accident, it's an eye-opening experience, right? It, it's a near-death experience, and, all, and you might have just been going to the grocery store. You know, it's, it's a combination of the banal with the life-threatening. That's what vehicles do. They're 2,000 pounds of steel, and they're dangerous. And you take them for granted, but you still need them. It goes, it's, it's two sides of the same coin. They're very useful uh, contraptions, but they're also dangerous. You forget about how dangerous they are until you have an accident. If someone loses a life, it's too late. That's what the basis of Vision Zero is, and the zero is, is the point. If anyone loses a loved one, to a traffic accident, especially if it's a pedestrian versus a car, it is, it, there is no consolation. You cannot console the, the family members of that loved one. And, you know, a little boy was just hit on Baggett Street by City Park the other day, just a couple weeks ago. Um, you know, critical condition. It's, you know, totally avoidable, and the driver themselves probably didn't even see it coming. Like, then they probably weren't of those 10% that Councillor Hutchison was talking about, the 10% that don't, that drive above the speed limit, might not, not, might not have even applied in that case. He might have been going the speed limit. Speed limit through Bagot, I believe, is 50 kilometers an hour. Bagot through City Park. It's a, it's a street that goes right through the middle of a park, and it's 50 kilometers an hour, right? So, collectively, we're all, the pendulum's swinging back. Now we're all worried about safety. This is a great start, but it's actually gonna take yearly effort by this committee to, to flesh this out and to help staff get where they need to go. So I'm, I'm satisfied with the work that's happened so far, but it's only the beginning. And the last thing I want to see is a status quo future for Kingston. This is, this is not about the status quo. This is about saving lives. I've dedicated my life to doing so in my other job. If I can do it in this job, it would make me very happy. Thank you. Well, the, uh, the person, the member of the committee who had the chair unfortunately had to leave the meeting, so I will take the time and give the chair back to you then, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Does anyone else wish to speak before we vote on the recommendation? Okay, then I'll call the vote on the amended recommendation. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Next is 7B, which is options for single-use plastics reduction. Keeping in mind, it is now 20 minutes to 9. So re a report from the commissioner, the Acting Commissioner of Community Services, and there's a recommendation. I guess staff can introduce the report, and you'll notice there is six clauses in the recommendation. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. Um, this report responds to Council's direction of June 26, 2018, requesting information and recommendations related to single-use plastics and uh, their reduction. Um, within the report, it's important to note the definition that we've applied to single-use plastics. 
Um, technically, there are many types of plastics, but the single-use plastics that we refer to are 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 those um, that are easily that are not sorry that are not easily recyclable and uh, are of a size or pattern that cause them to end up either as garbage or litter. Uh, and those are things like plastic bags, straws, cups, stir sticks, cutlery, takeout food containers, and the like. Um, report examines the uh, global, regional, and local impacts of single-use plastics, and we recognize the, uh, the environmental problems that are posed by these materials on our oceans within our Great Lakes and along the shorelines of Kingston and in Kingston's public spaces. Um, importantly, the report also describes the municipal cost to collect and recycle, or at least try and recycle, these types of materials. Um, items like plastic bags and polystyrene often are uh, collected, but gain, we gain no revenue because of a lack of places that will accept these, these items. Other smaller single-use plastic items are often not compatible with the process that, that we use at Kingston Area Recycling Center, and, uh, and even though they're collected as recyclables, will end up as litter, or sorry, as garbage. Um, the report also looks at public opinions on, um, on single-use plastics. Um, we did uh, do a cursory Get Involved campaign that received over 1,700 visits and 124 ideas for single-use plastic reduction from Kingstonians. Um, we saw petitions, uh, notably one from Elgenburg School with 1,500 signatures on it looking to remove plastic bags and polystyrene. Um, and within Canada Ontario, and Ontario, um, it's important to note also that uh, a uh, poll commissioned by Nanos uh, Research in 2019 showed 80% support or somewhat support nationally and in Ontario for a complete ban on single-use plastics. We've examined other jurisdictions um, and uh, ex examined how they've proceeded with reductions to single-use plastics. And there's a gamut of those um, from laws that require a minimum charge for uh, reusable plastic bags to others that are um, commitments to ban single-use plastics. And notably, Canada and Europe both committing to banning a number of single-use plastics by 2021. Um, based on all that, um, there are the report does recommend approaches um, to reducing single-use plastics in Kingston. First and foremost is leading by example, and what we're re recommending here is emulating the National uh, Arts uh, Center single-use plastic reduction approach and removing single-use plastics from both the Grand Theatre and the Invista Center in 2020. That will require the establishment of an organic waste collection within those facilities and the use of compostable plastic replacement materials. Uh, and with also attention to um, collecting or using and collecting materials that are compatible with the existing composting facility that Norterra runs here locally. Um, we also seek to examine municipal practices and policies to remove single-use plastics from things like special events and through vendor licensing. Um, even though a federal restriction or ban on single-use plastics is by far the most preferred approach, we would avoid a patchwork of bylaws and approaches from municipality to municipality, um, we do recommend a contingency um, to proceed with the initial steps for consultation on a potential local single-use plastic elimination bylaw in case the federal government will not or cannot follow through. Um, and we also recommend support, continuing support for local leaders and public awareness on the single-use plastics issue, notably Sustainable Kingston's Plastic Free Summer Challenge, which has seen a doubling of participation from 2018 to 2019. Um, the financial aspects that are presented associated with these recommendations are generally minor, um, and the report uh, recognizes that we will be able to use existing budgets uh, somewhat, but the additional budget requirements required to do things like um, purchasing uh, new containers and signage and so forth for an organic waste stream in the Grand Theatre and Invista Centre those will be included to included within budget submissions 
operating and capital budget submissions for 2020. Um, and we have Heather Roberts from Solid Waste here to, to assist us with any questions you have, as well as myself and Peter Hugenboss. Yeah, that's great. Any of the committee? Councilor Doherty. Um, the, uh, thank you, and through you. Um, the cost of, so you mentioned that they're, um, that they're money to generate it from recycling that, or does it cost, how, how much, us, and how, how much does that maybe offset the, co the additional cost of replacing styrofoam? Chair. Um, I don't know that any of the costs presented in this report would actually um, reduce the amount of styrofoam that is being used. I think the single-use plastics item is the plastic bags, straws, um, other cups and beverage containers. That styrofoam, I mean, takeout containers, yes. Um, there would be a small percentage of reduced costs possibly with that, uh, I would say yes. Um, but to quantify that is difficult. The city sends out about 40 tons of styrofoam for recycling per year. That's what we're capturing at the recycling plant. And we're sending that out somewhere in the neighborhood between $12,000 to $15,000 per year. So out of that 40 tons that we are shipping out and it's costing us money, the, the waste industry is all by weight. So whatever we can reduce from that, from single-use styrofoam food containers, there will be some cost savings, but those are relatively a light material. And often those are the, the kinds of styrofoam that are soiled and would be ending up in, in the garbage in the plant and managed. So um, if we can get businesses and people reducing that, there will certainly be... Um, a reduction in the waste management costs of that, but it, it's difficult to quantify that at this time. I have more going to um, restaurants to buy takeout food and bring their own containers. Are there some health regulations stopping that, or could we do a campaign around that? Listen, um, I don't know if there are health regulations that would prevent that from happening. Um, but we can certainly uh, we can certainly look into that. That was actually not an option or idea that was brought up through our consultation. So I'm surprised it wasn't. On that point, I know that at Terra Natural Foods and other stores like that, people bring their own containers, and that they're a commercial, they have a license. So I'm I'm assuming it must be it must be okay, but. <laughs> it's a good one. Mr. Sanic. Thank you. If for the vendor that works at the Invista Center or at the Grand Theater, if somebody needed some food to, you know, like take home, like I'm thinking French fries, leftover French fries or so, are there like paper boxes it could go into um, instead of like styrofoam or would we be telling the vendor at Infista Center, you know, they can't supply any sort of container? Through you, Mr. Chair. No. And here is um, at the Grand Theater and the Invista Center to identify alternative products to single-use plastic. So there are a number of products on the market, be they paper or biodegradable plastics that are, uh, you know, certified as, as such. Uh, and it would be our intention to replace those sorts of items that are needed by the, the concessions um, to do their business with materials that um, are not single-use plastics by definition and can be either um, recycled or turned into uh, or compost through an organic waste stream. Thanks, thanks for that um, clarification, that helps a lot. And then my second question is for Ms. Roberts, right? So on the bottom of page 102 in the report, it says, like, it's on the list, suggested actions for the city of Kingston. And it does say pet waste to be composted in the green bin. So that is only if we ever get there. Is that right? Because I know we've had lots of email trails um, in 2019 about 
dog waste, but we're not there yet. It would be too, it wouldn't be affordable to send the dog waste up to Ottawa for that one anaerobic digester. So this is only proposed if we can get there one day. Is that correct? I'm going to start answer this one through you, Mr. Chair. Um, on page 102, what that exhibit is showing is the results of our Get Involved consultation where we received ideas from people interested in, in uh, reducing single-use plastic. So that was one of the ideas that was submitted. It's not, it's not uh, a recommended action uh, at this time. Thanks. That idea does come up a lot. I was just trying to write them down. The, um, let me just see now. Oh, is it possible? It seems if, I know that if uh, Councillor Kylie was here, <laughs> he would be emphasizing. Uh, my question is this: He would be emphasizing the health issues to do with plastic, and it's a, and what I'm speaking to here is that the the tact to be taken the approach to be taken in this, which I generally support. The, um, and that is, I have read that their microscopic pieces of plastic have infiltrated uh, human cells and even DNA. And I'm wondering if we found anything like that in our research. Because, as and this goes back to Councilor Carley, he once said to me, and sitting beside me is, this issue will turn on the human health issues, just like cigarette smoke did. Rather than trying to convince people with all the other good arguments we give, <laughs> it's killing you. It's in you. It's in your child. So, I mean, but I'm not swearing to this. I want to know if you found it. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, the you know, the, the main impetus for this kind of action in this report is the environment um, impacts caused by this discarded and littered single-use plastics. Um, there's also a, uh, an energy and greenhouse gas emission aspect to this. But we also did find that there is, there is um, commentary to the effect that as plastics are in the environment, they break down to smaller and smaller pieces and those smaller and smaller pieces become more ingestible to smaller and smaller, smaller organisms, and therefore the plastics get into the food chain and presumably get into us at some point. So there is that health connection. I think it's pretty nascent right now, um, but nevertheless, you know, I, I think over the next couple of years, we're gonna see more and more um, well-articulated links to that, that human health aspect of microplastics. That's good. I recognize what you're saying from this report because I did read it. The, um, and thank you for that. But I think we should pursue that because the way this goes is there's an up and down type of consciousness on the part of the public. They get it. They don't get it. They, they want to do it. They don't want to do it. And, uh, but if we can demonstrate it's a health issue, maybe people at Queen's would know done the research, I have connections to researchers. So I, I just want to suggest that. And um, um, there's a th question on page, uh, well, it's 82, it's 78 of the report, I think. But 82, if you're going through our our version, and that is, um, it says 60% of single-use plastics consist of plastic film wrap and bags. Then it says 60% of discarded SUPs end up in the garbage stream. Um, so is that 60% of 60% are ending up in the stream, and that we're capturing the rest? I just wanted to understand what those two statements meant. I can. Um, possibly make that clearer to you, if I can find it. Uh. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, the, uh, 
it's what, what that paragraph is trying to say mm -hmm. is that 60% of all single-use plastics observed within the collection stream were observed within the garbage side of the collection stream. Of all of the six, of all of, all of the single-use plastics collected, 60% was plastic film. So it's, it's unfortunate it's the same number, it's a bit confusing, but. Um, my purpose for asking that question is, it's pretty clear that a ban would be a benefit to the municipality because we're losing money and it's affecting our efficiency of our operation and it's in the interests of uh, taxes. <laughs> so I'm looking for arguments, okay? Like when I read these things, I say, how am I going to sell this? So everything works here. If it, we're losing money, even though we're doing the right thing, then a ban actually makes financial sense. Sorry, Mr. Hugenbos. Through the chair. Yeah, through, yes, and, and through the chair. Uh, yes, when we looked at the numbers and the, the data working with the director of solid waste, knowing that it is a difficult marketplace to dispose, if you will, of the, of the collected recyclable plastic film, um, we looked at how to, um, uh, how to come back to this committee with a recommendation uh, based on that data. And as Director McClatchy said earlier, um, the preference for bans would be at a higher level, such as a federal level, um, in order to do it nationwide and be consistent through all producers and consumers. Um, but as a contingency plan, if you will, staff are seeking direction from the committee through council to look at what a ban could be, engage the public and stakeholders and find out how that would go um, if a ban doesn't come through on a, on a federal level. Um, that, though, that information with a cost-benefit analysis, there are costs to dispose, there will be costs to implement a ban and enforce a ban and, and make it work. So we want to come back with that information that wasn't in the direction that we had to come back at this time. Um, but looking at those numbers that you, you talked about, we wanted to um, seek that direction for council to look more into those numbers um, to, to be able to make a decision if need be, if there isn't a higher level ban put in place. So I'll go to one of the more important questions I had. And that is, as I read this, it seemed, and perhaps you gave part of an answer there to my question. The, we're going to eliminate the subs from the Grand Theater and the Invista Center as a start. And then we're going to phase into other facilities. Um, I'm not sure we've got the time to do that kind of thing, like in the sense that we have about 10 years, 11 years to get our act together. And this is one small element of the climate change strategy, right? And it just goes to show just how difficult this is gonna be, right? So I'm not trying to be critical for the sake of being critical at all. It just demonstrates, I mean, there's all kinds of good information here. Um, so, what, will we receive, for instance, a timetable for moving on to those other municipal, municipal facilities? Because the whole thing seems kind of, I don't want to be insulting, I, 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 timid, okay? Like, relative to the problem, okay? And, I, and so part of the answer may be that you're saying, look, these other people may ban it in the meantime, get our footing here, so we'll still have something, even if they fail to do it, which I think is a good observation. Because this is what happened with cosmetic lawn pesticides. They had to do it because all the municipalities were slowly tumbling over each other to do it, right? And uh, so they just cut it off and said, no, we're not going to do this. Now, I'm not sure it's entirely enforced, but there we are. So by us doing what you're suggesting, I think is a good idea. I'm just concerned that it won't be fast enough. So get a response to that, or is this a strategic 
answer. Yep, and through you, Mr. Chair, uh, I think it's important that we do it right and we put in a timeline that we think um, is achievable. We, we, we think strongly that it's achievable and, and perhaps sooner. And the, the key thing is to start out with um, municipal facilities like the Grand Theater that we fully control um, what comes in and out of that venue as far as events and to uh, source replacement items for the plastics that we are using at this time. And what we can do with, with that experience is use those learnings to apply it to other uh, municipal facilities as well as share those learnings with the broader community. And as we note in the report, there's already private sector um, uh, businesses that have adjusted and, and reduced or eliminated single-use plastics from their operations. So it's all about um, a start. It's reversing uh, a long-term long trend. And we want to make sure we can do it successfully, uh, properly educate and inform and get good buy-in at those, at those facilities, um, including the Invisa Center, and apply those learnings to, to other facilities. So uh, it, it all, the difficult part is starting, I, I agree, and it takes time to do it right, but it uh, can then roll over into many other facilities based on those learnings. Yeah, but it's not really a debate between you and staff about the merits of the recommendation. We're going to vote on the recommendation, right? I mean, if, you, if you're asking questions, that's fine, but I'm not going to allow you to debate us. Okay, so there's the six, recommend the six clauses in the recommendation. Um, we go to members of the public, and then we will move the recommendation. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Frank Dixon again. Um, I'm very impressed with what I see here. And I'm seeing some good discussion also from the members of the committee and information provided by staff. So I'm also going to push a little bit more aggressive approach to this. It's a good start, taking up Councillor Hutchison's um, line of thought on this. So I'm, I'm going to have some, I, I, I don't have 20 points, I've got about five or six, so I'm asking the clerk to take them down. Um, so the two city-owned facilities are a good start, as staff have said. The center I'm really concerned about is the Leon Center. Right? Not only is it a much larger facility, but there's much more in the way of, say, fast food sales going on there at a front next game or other concerts or that kind of thing, right? So huge amounts of waste being generated. And I would like to see detailed study of the Leon Center operation start right now. Um, with understanding what's really going on there. I think that's a better place to really un um, grapple with the leading edge of the problem. Um, and I'd like to see a coordination between what's happening here and the new environmental committee, of which Councillor Doherty is one of the co-chairs. That's a great initiative on its own. So a cooperation between those two with the um, Invista and the Grand Theater, some education on what can be done at the site by users who are generating the waste through things they buy. So just maybe some explanations there. Some people don't like to be told this, for sure, right? So I'd like to see some work done on comparisons with what Kingston is doing compared to other municipalities, right? 
we've got an aspirational goal of being Canada's most sustainable city, and we've made excellent progress on many fronts on that. So that's to the credit of council, the community, staff, all of those components are great. We have got a downtown BIA restaurant component that's very wasteful in this respect. Just go into any place and observe from the standpoint of not, say, a social standpoint, you're enjoying with your friends, you're watching a game, you're listening to music, whatever. Look at what they do. It is just awful, the stuff that's tossed out. So there's colossal improvement there. Just on the health aspect, which I think uh, Councillor Hutchison was talking about, I do recall an article in Scientific American magazine dealing with this in the recent past, and I believe Canada's National Research Council has done some work on it as well. I uh, don't have the details on that. Certainly we've seen it in certain, say, fish and sea animal cells, right? The, the, you know, you know, you know, the, actual den uh, the genetics and the health are really being modified in, in a, a very worse way there. So now my final point is, given that we have a leading university in Kingston and St. Lawrence College is here, at Queens, we have RMC, could the city really do something important by commissioning research to be done by the environmental um, engineering and science groups at those universities on just what's happening on these, these areas? Because like, Kingston is probably one of the leading places in Canada on this topic right now. We're taking it up, that's great. But could we actually combine with our post-secondary institutions and produce something that's really important and original, right? Take a leading role and, and get a hold of this because as Councilor Hutchison says, our time to respond to this is declining. We're in trouble and we have to step up and deal with it. So, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public that wish to speak? All right, so we need a mover and a seconder for the recommendation. Councillor Osterhoff, Councillor Osanek. That the IATP committee recommend to council that staff be directed to remove municipal municipally supplied single-use plastics from the Grand Theatre and Vista Centre operations by mid-2020 and other municipal facilities in subsequent years and incorporate related costs into future operating capital budgets and that staff be directed to undertake a review of municipal policies that are known to generate the use of non-essential single-use plastic products on municipal property such as but not limited to the special events policy and review the service agreements the city has with organizations and partners that deliver services for opportunities to eliminate or reduce non-essential single-use plastic products and bring forward recommendations to council or committee for amendments as appropriate and the staff be directed to prepare for the possibility that the federal provincial controls on single-use plastics may not occur and undertake a public engagement with residents, business, other st stakeholders on the matter of a potential municipal bylaw or other methods to eliminate single plastic retail shopping bags and polystyrene conv convenience food containers from distribution in Kingston and that staff report back to the EITP committee by mid-2020 on the results of public engagement and a recommendation regarding the implementation of a potential bylaw including the estimated financial impact to implement and enforce a bylaw, and that staff continue to support the work of Sustainable Kingston and others to enhance awareness of single-use plastic issue in the community and increase participation in related challenge programming to reduce and eliminate single-use practice, and that staff will continue to support learning and awareness of the single-use plastic issue and options for single-use plastic reduction through the city's website, communication channels, and through employment, engagement, and training. Any debate? Councillor Doherty. One, I think one. Um, I'd like to add a clause to that, although it's a long one, the clause is short. That, ex that staff explore alternatives for the use of single-use plastics when ordering food in for councillors and or staff. Do you have that in? Uh, in really messy writing. That's fine, it'll just be helpful. Can I borrow that? So all we need to do, really, is bring in our own Tupperware and leave it with the clerks, right? 
Yeah, and just leave it in a drawer somewhere. Everyone's got extra stuff, right? I've got some camping dishes, actually. There's a dishwasher downstairs already. I see staff nodding agreement to the amendment, so. Okay. We don't need to put this on the screen, do we? Everyone understands it's for our own meals upstairs. Yeah. Say, seconded by Councilor Osterhoff. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, any debate on the amendment to uh, include Councilor Takeout Food to the recommendation? Councilor Osterhoff. Yeah. Okay. All those in favor? And that carries. Any other debate about the motion, about the recommendation? So mid-2020, that's less than a year away. We will, we will hear about this again, if it passes. All those in favor? And that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. So that's the last item of business. There were two items, three items of correspondence, including the presentation from, the excellent presentation from Michael Capon, a, a note about artificial turf, lawns, a potential ban there, and also something about a recent waste disposal experience. Our next meeting is not until October. I was talking to Derek earlier, I thought maybe we might have to adjourn and have an extra meeting like in September if we weren't going to finish tonight. But Now that we're, I'm looking for someone to adjourn, that's not the case. Thank you for sticking with us. Um, need a motion to adjourn? Councillor Rosenhoff, Councillor Doherty, all those in favour? Thank you very much.